Hey guys, so I just got done with uh, my interview with Ivan the Troll, and I figured I'd go ahead and, and uh, do this introduction for uh, uh, this podcast right now, uh, because it's fresh on my mind, and uh, there's uh, there's a few things I want to, uh, to say before I forget. Uh, so first off, this is going to be a long episode. Um, but there was, uh, just, just, uh, no way around it. Um, there just wasn't. Um, it's going to get extremely ner uh, extremely nerdy and, uh, extremely nuanced. Uh, now, as I said in the episode, um, which you'll hear, I don't make money off of doing the Vaughn podcast. Um, you know, I don't. Um, I do it because, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very passionate about Vanu. I'm very passionate about uh, the prospects that it brings to, to self-liberation and freedom. Uh, so when I get someone on, um, whether it's a Mesh Networks or the Brian Sovereign or whatever the hell it may be, if it's something I'm super interested in and uh, I have someone on to talk to, uh, yeah, it, might be, it might be a longer episode. Uh, that's what this is going to be. Uh, I don't know what it's going to turn out to after editing, um, but it's at least going to be like, almost three hours it's gonna be almost three hours um typically i'd break these episodes up but i'm not I, I, i'm just not gonna do it I'm just not gonna do it yeah it's gonna be longer uh some folks might not listen all the way through and uh you'll be missing out on a lot um now the reason I'm, I'm not going to cut it up into multiple multiple episodes is one, um, you know, I just let him roll. I mean, Ivan is so knowledgeable on firearms. Um, any question that brought up, any question that was brought that uh, I brought up from from listeners or from from uh, people on Twitter, uh, he just there, he's just a wealth of information. And I don't want to, uh, you know, neglect any of the uh, gun enthusiasts uh, from from such information or for folks that are interested in 3D printing firearms or manufacturing the, their own means of self-defense. So I didn't cut anything off. I let him roll, and I'm very, very happy that I did. Um, now, the second reason for uh, the reason I'm not going to cut this episode in, in parts is because next week uh, we'll be getting together uh, to record uh, again. Um, it'll be a, it'll be at least a few episodes, at least a few episodes. Um, and I wanted to mention uh, there were a couple folks who asked really great questions about how to get started uh, with 3D printing, you know, how much time, money, effort does it take, all that sort of stuff. Um, I didn't ignore your questions. I was going to ask them. But uh, we got uh, pretty far through this podcast, and uh, we kind of uh, already had, we whether I, I don't remember if we acknowledge it or not, but we, we kind of already figured that we're going to do multiple, multiple episodes because there's so much content, um, there's so much important stuff here that uh, we just. Uh, we got to do multiple, multiple episodes. Uh, so Ivan will be back um, next week. We'll be, I, I guess it's uh, 3D printing and CAD 101. And the next episodes, we'll just, we'll do stuff like uh, gun printing 101 for, for those folks who want to get started. Um, I don't know what's going to come next, but this is going to be, this is going to be a series. Uh, it's, there's, there's no way around it. And it is super, super important because if you don't have the means to self-defense, then, then what do you have? Now here in America, um, as we, as we kind of discussed in the episode, it's not super urgent yet. Obviously, uh, there's 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 a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on in the media uh, with mass shootings and things, but it's not an absolute necessity yet. Um, in other countries, it definitely is uh, with 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 super super restrictive regulations. So, anyway, it's going to be a long episode. We might get down into the weeds of some things multiple times, and uh, when we when we talk about his story, basically, uh, uh, you know, the state senator. Uh, petitioning Twitter to, or lobbying Twitter to, to, to close his account. Yeah, we're, we're going to get on, on some digressions and tangents, but it's all important, and uh, there was there were a couple points. He, he mentioned something a couple times that I had to interject and say, all right, we're, we're not going to wait for this anymore. You mentioned a couple times, let's, let's, let's dig into it. So, yeah, this was a super fun episode for me, super long, um, but it is really, really important, uh, really important for the future of freedom. So, um, I hope you guys enjoy it. I really, really do. And I really hope you stick around to the end of the episode, especially for the building the Agora segment, uh, which I know isn't going to get as much attention this week because it's a three hour long episode. Some of you aren't going to listen all the way through. I understand. I really, really do. Um, but, uh, this is a very, very important episode. Uh, so without further ado, please enjoy my interview with Ivan the Troll and, uh, yeah, build firearms in your basement. <laughs> You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. 
This podcast, everything found, the, uh, everything found on the website, is covered by Bipcot's no government license, so as reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. You can learn more, you can learn more by visiting bipcot.org. Uh, so first off, uh, I'm not going to pound you with a two-minute advertisement before or during this this podcast, so please make sure to stick around to the end of the show uh, for our Building the Agora segment, uh, where we highlight great Agorist businesses, uh, podcasts, etc., that uh, that could use your support, and uh, you know lots of great uh, products and services uh, there uh, for you. Anyway, that's it. Let's, uh, let's get right into this one today. Back on episode number 51 of this podcast, titled Manufacturing the Means of Self-Defense, 3D Printing and Ghost Gunning, uh, we covered the subject generally, uh, but today on this 54th episode of the podcast, the 12th installment of our Crypto Anarchism series, I'm joined by an individual who has been at the forefront of this, uh, falling right in line behind Cody Wilson. On Twitter, he went by Ivan the Troll, at least until his account was permabanned, uh, following some lobbying by a New Jersey state senator who will now, uh, for at least... On my end, to be known as Senator Shithead, uh, but uh, he now runs. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, Ivan now runs our con- runs or contributes uh, to the uh, to the Twitter account uh, Deterrence Dispense, a decentralized gun enthusiast group, ensuring that individuals will always be able to possess uh, p- not only possess firearms but uh, own the means of production. So, if there are any commies listening to this, and that should sound. Great. Seizing the means of production through 3D printing. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> um, so, yeah, needless to say, this is going to be a fun one. Uh, so, Ivan, welcome to the Vanu Podcast, sir. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, so, how does it feel to be doing God's work? How does it feel to be doing God's work? Oh, man. And when you put it like that, I'm worried that I'll eventually develop an ego about what I do. <laughs> I mean, I, I enjoy this stuff. I, I enjoy messing around with this stuff, and I've liked, you know, CAD for ages and ages and ages. I mean, for, for, from the first, I had a class in high school doing CAD, and I took to it like a fish takes to water, or like, you know, like the savant kids pick up an instrument they never had before, and they can just play it. Like, you know, that was me with CAD. I was just, you know, I found my knack with it, and I really liked it. And, and then I'd draw stuff in CAD, and a school had a, like a little, like a really old 3D printer. Wow. Uh, in, in fact, it was so old, it was called a rapid prototype machine, not a 3D printer. So, that, you know, that puts it like 2000s or earlier. Mm-hmm. And of course, no printing. Of course, no printing guns on the school printer. Not that <laughs> I mean, you know, printing. The, I guess this will date me some, but Cody was like only barely started with his antagonism whenever I was in that class in high school. But okay. uh, so gun printing wasn't something you know people were worried about anyway. But uh, you know, I was interested in the concept of 3D printing. Really, really neat to me. You know, from my very first introduction to CAD, uh, the teacher teacher there at uh, the school was a really cool guy uh, really interested in getting kids interested in like the the trades and technical stuff like that and so you know he one of like one of the first projects we did in that class was you designed a keychain in cad and then he'd let you 3d print it and take it home show your parents or whatever you know wow. a cool little thing yeah yeah that's yeah, and so i mean you know j- just just from that looking like that first part that i had ever had 3d printed it was like you fall in love with the technology that quickly. It's like, well, you know, and, you know, all, all you do is make a keychain, and you think, well, that's really neat. I've made something in three-dimensional space that I had drawn, and you know, on a computer. You know, it's something real I can touch. And I guess I probably probably I should have started with you know my background with guns. Uh, it's like the classic Midwestern American boy growing up, you know, around guns from so you know as young as I can remember, and always always liked them. You know, one of those you had your first gun whenever you like, as before fifth grade. It was really young, but I'm... Uh, like like a classic. You know, I'm from a firearms background, a pro pro gun family, even beyond my direct family. Lots of pro gun folks I'm surrounded by, and so it took me surprisingly long to put my two uh, passions there together. My passion for I like CAD and 3D printing and my passion for I like guns. And, you know, I was well aware of what Cody was doing and had been following his illegal drama like back with the State Department law battle. You know, I'd been reading the filings and the briefs. And even then I wasn't, you know, so I'm well aware of, uh, the, you know, the battle going on. I'm well aware of you can 3D print certain parts of guns. But, you know, it took me up until it would have been a little over a year ago before I really got into printing guns. Yeah. Interesting. And interesting. So, those... I, I guess the, the first question, I, I guess there, this is going to be, a, 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 I guess, uh, two questions and one, but I don't want to forget. Um, so you come from a pro gun family. So um, uh, what does your family think about? Do they know about the work that you're doing with uh, with 3D printing gun parts? And then uh, I guess the, the second one, you kind of alluded to it. But um, as far as combining uh, both of your passions... <clears throat> 
how influential was was Cody um, on that? Uh, so for the first question, they do know and they're supportive of what I do, but they they would prefer I not do it just from the standpoint of you know there's always the I I don't think it's a realistic threat, but there is a threat of legal trouble. No matter so so anytime you do something that upsets people, there's a risk of legal trouble. Doesn't matter what it is you're doing. Right. And for for some reason in this country, there's some rights that you can exercise that gets you in legal trouble. I don't know why that's the case, but that's the world we live in, where you know some rights are protected that you can exercise them, and some rights are not protected you can't exercise them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can't. I mean, in New, New Jersey's law, the fact that they're able to pass that ghost gun ban, you know, the, the way that that's worded, I mean, it's just it's just bizarre that such a thing could even stand in this country. It's some it's something I've I've sort of mused about before. It's like a, you know, j- j- wouldn't it be so nice if I could just exercise these rights that I have and people would leave me alone? But you know, it's just not the world we live in. Right, and just just jump in real quick. Um, you know, going back to my interview with Cody, um, I think this was in regards to the New Jersey thing. It's it's been a while. It feels like it's been like two or three years, but it's only been like it's been less than a year, probably like seven or eight months. Um, but anyway, uh, he was talking about how like this 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 is really important. You know what's what was what you know what, what was happening to to him and or to Defense Distributed and what's still happening to Defense Distributed, and that's that ruling. Um, I think if I remember correctly, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but <clears throat> that makes basically the sharing of gun files at all illegal right for everybody so even beyond that so new, way back when new jersey filed that just so, so see yeah, new jersey's first filing there was that it would make sharing gun files at all illegal but this bill that they signed into law makes it so everything up to and including advertising gun files uh, advertising how to make a gun it's not even just gun files it's advertising any information that teaches you how to make a gun and because so not even advertising was included in just there, just homemade, like homemade right, guns, like right, CNC. Right. So, so, uh, so, you know, so advertising is such a broad term. Uh, you know, at its at its you know widest interpretation, me telling you that it's possible to three D print a gun is advertising the fact that you can three D print a gun. And now I've broken a law by simply mentioning a term. And it was because I put a string of words in a sentence together, I'm now a felon in New Jersey. Which is uh, not what this country was founded on. <clears throat> no, that's that I is mean, it's, it's crazy. Like, I, I would call it like strikingly Nazi, but I don't even think. I mean, yeah, it, I guess at times, yeah, sure, they went that far for certain groups of people in certain speech. But this is everyone. Every group of people cannot talk about this entire chapter of speech. Like you can't, you know. So, so as an example of this, if I told you that you know, fire AR-15 uh, fire control group pen hole is like one one fifty six in diameter. It's a felony in New Jersey. I've committed a felony. And you know what I said? I said 156 hole diameter. Because I'm, I mean, I'm giving you this is technical information you could use to make a gun. Because they didn't stop at files. They didn't stop at 3D printable files. They stopped at advertising the information exists. So if I told you, hey, you can pull up a picture on Google that tells you the dimensions for an AR-15 is lower, it's a felony. Jesus Christ! I didn't realize it was to that extent. So, like, so how does this affect? <clears throat> and this is these aren't questions in my outline. I'm just you know coming up with these. But um, like, yeah, that, this wasn't planned. But <clears throat> I guess how, how does that impact um, you know the major gun manufacturers? I mean, they have. I I don't know if so. Do they when they put up their guns for sale? Can they just not? Uh, or or is it or the, or they license and it's okay? Um, or is it like I, I, how does that work? If you have any idea. So it's just another example of how it's like with any totalitarian law, it just becomes harder and harder to enforce. And I am being at least I'm, and I'll admit I'm being a little bit hyperbolic because until New Jersey prosecutes someone for saying that you can make a gun with a 3D printer and calling that advertising, you know, what I'm doing is like it's projecting. It's New Jersey could do this based on what they've said sure. as far as, you know, as far as my understanding of it. They've made it so advertising is illegal. In my mind, advertising is like if you go and tell a group of people that such a thing exists is, I mean, one form of advertising. But like, like, a, like uh, there's, a, there's companies that will sell like, you know, like those gun mats that you use for cleaning that show an exploded assembly of a gun. Yeah, I was in a discussion you know, a bunch of people were like, you know, tossing, making fun of this New Jersey law. But, you know, we then realized that gun mat is now a felony in New Jersey. If you have a mat, because that tells you how to put together a gun. Mm. So you know, so where's that line drawn? Like, how high definition of a picture of an AR, res- you know, a lower receiver do you need before you can just pull the mentions from that picture? 
And then, and then another, and then it, was, it was like a little side project of mine that never went anywhere because I didn't want to sink the time into it. But I was trying to use pictures like the New Jersey police sh- shared of where their officers have ARs, you know, that they're carrying mm-hmm. and using those high definition images to at least like, you know, if I can just pull three or four dimensions, you know, so like look at the wristwatch or see if there's a coin in the picture, like some reference dimension you can pull and then use that to, you know, pull dimensions off of this picture of a gun. You know, I can at least have like a clever argument of look at how stupid New Jersey is. They're breaking their own law by posting a picture of a cop with an AR. Because yeah. they've now given me this information that I can make a gun with. That's crazy. I mean, I, it's it's not crazy. I mean, it's it's crazy. It's not. It's okay. So it's crazy, but it's not surprising. I'll put it that way. Uh, when it comes to the state, right. um, and and with 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 all legislation, it seems like um, it's 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 worded so loosely that they can come after anyone for anything. Um, so like it, and it, it obviously, you know, in their monop- in their monopolistic courts, uh, you know, you might, uh, like, at, you know, according to the law, you might interpret it as, well, this is okay. You know, like this has to be okay. But if they take that into, uh, you know, and take that into a court, I mean, New Jersey, well, obviously the, the, the deck's weighted against you. So basically what they say goes, um, you know, however they interpret that, uh, that, that law, that, that very overarching law is, is what it's, you know, what it's, what it's going to be. And that'll, that'll kind of set a precedent, right? So as, as you kind of said earlier, no one's been prosecuted yet, um, yet. <laughs> so, uh, we'll, we'll have to see, uh, you know, it's, you know, <laughs> you know, reality is stranger than fiction, um, a lot of times. So, right. uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see, uh, we'll have to see how that's, how that goes. Um, can't really know now. <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right. Well, that was, that was a good, that was a good little, um, uh, yeah, good little uh, uh, intro- uh, introduction there. So b- before we get too far into the, into the gun thing, I, I want to kind of get more uh, more on your background uh, and get an idea of uh, kind of uh, your, your uh, where, where you're aligned philosophically or ide- uh, you know ideologically and things of that nature. So um, you, you mentioned you came from uh, you know a, a gun friendly uh, you know uh, you know uh, you know a gun friendly family, all that sort of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, where, where where do you where do you align philosophically? Uh, anarchist, libertarian, conservative, uh, etc. So to answer that in one word, because I feel like I've been like uh, over explaining it almost, I don't want to say like dodging the question, but like not explaining, not explaining my answer, giving my explanation and then not giving the answer. Uh, so I, if I had to put it in like one word, it'd be like sort of like a minarchist. I can understand that the government is like, uh, government as itself isn't, uh, ha- doesn't have to be a bad idea. It's just the fact that anytime you give someone power, they use that power to exploit people. Mm-hmm. So, yep. you know, I, I can see a world where, like, an incredibly limited government, like a government that's only there to give out punishment to the people who do wrong would be okay. But I, I can acknowledge that such a thing will never, ever exist because uh, you, know, you either have power or you don't. So I guess and, – and to get back to, like, there was the second part of that question you'd asked about what my folks thought. And, like, the second oh, part yeah. of that question was, like, how do my align, views align with Cody? I mean, like, how does Cody inspire my uh, Correct. Uh, 3D yeah, yeah. printing? So I, I feel like it, it's like a weird thing, and I'm, you might be able to relate to it, and I'm sure a couple other people are, but like when he speaks, the words he says just sound right. It's like w- when he explains his particular views on a you know, political thing, I can just nod my head and go, yeah, you know what? I don't have a problem with that. And I don't think any other speaker you know, I, I'm capable of doing that with. I, I, like you, you, know, you, you pick a speaker, like you know, Trump's an easy target. Like he can say some things, and sometimes I'm like, okay, I agree, and then sometimes I'm like, the fuck, are you talking about? <laughs> and it, it's like, it's it's like, but but with Cody, it's like consistently, yeah, no, I get you, yeah, no, I get you, or like you know, you explain something that like, I couldn't put it into words, but he can he can put it into words, and then you know that explains my feelings about a particular thing. Yeah, you know, I, I I'm right there with you. Um, yeah, and and since when I I first I guess found out about him. Um, with the, uh, and, and the, the re- and I mean, this is how everyone, how a lot of people found, found out about him, right? Uh, when the Liberator Pistol was taken down, when, when he was required to take it down, you know what the first thing I did was? I went and downloaded the Liberator Pistol download. and uploaded yeah. it to my yeah. website and made it available for people to download. <laughs> so, like, that was how I found out about him. And then I started watching some of his interviews, and then, um, basically I lost... I don't know, like three or four days. Well, it, I, I, I can't even say I lost three or four days of my life because you know I gained so much in those three right. or four days. But I watched everything that was ever that he ever put out on on YouTube, um, and then I kind of got into the crypto anarchism stuff and you know Amir Taki and and like it was just like this this uh, <clears throat> I don't know like um, 
I guess I guess what I'm trying to say, you know, I, I I'm right there with you. Um, you know, Cody's one of those folks. Like there there are a lot of folks that you know, a lot of people, you know, authors and, and speakers where, you know, I'll I'll watch you know some of their stuff and you know I'll agree with it, it'll be good, and then other stuff it's like hey, you know, whatever. But everything Cody puts out is just gold. Um, I don't know why. Yeah. I I don't know why that like I, I don't know why that is. I don't know if that's intentional by him, but maybe I I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think like 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 the thing that I connected most with. And it was like the final nail in the coffin of like a Co- Cody's ideology explains how I feel, even though I'm not, I guess my, my, my view, my, my views aren't mature enough for me to put it into words. But like when, when I, in that interview, that CBS interview that I had mentioned on Twitter with mm-hmm. Ducopal, like when, whenever he asked him, do you want to know how to print the gun? You know, it's a yes or no question. You get to make that decision for yourself, but I don't think you get to make it for anybody else. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, that, you know, that perfectly sums up my view on all of this is uh, we live in a society that, you know, t- tells us we're free and that we're free to learn about the things we want to learn about. We're free to speak about the things that we learn about. You know, we're free to be interested in these things. That's, you know, that's what society tells us. And society also tells us, you know, we have this right to bear arms, and, you know, regardless of how you feel about it. You know, society, maybe society doesn't tell us you have this thing. Society debates about it, but... We have a natural right to defend ourselves, and our Constitution acknowledges that right. So, it's, it's so, so so it's like the you you know you don't you don't have that you don't have the right to make that decision for other people. So you you don't get to no no one gets to tell me what it is that I'm interested in. No one gets to tell me that me knowing about guns is too dangerous. No one gets to say that me telling other people what I know about guns is too dangerous. It's like you know, the dangerous information thing is uh, something that Nazi propaganda relied on. Like, you know, you can't trust this information. It's too dangerous. You know, these, these sort of things, when you talk about them, bad things happen. So you can't talk about these certain things. It's, I yep. mean, in one hand, it's laughable. Like, all I want to do is laugh at it. But on the other hand, it's like the, the sickening reality of, I, either people actually buy into that crap that there's such a thing as dangerous information or people are just complacent with the fact that the government will call it that. And it's like the, you know, the, the, I didn't speak out, uh, quote that, the mm-hmm. uh, Neil, Neil, so when they came for yeah, me, Neil Yeah. I don't remember. Right, saying, but right. Yeah, Neil Muller from Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I definitely know what you mean. And uh, as far as like you know the, the dangerous stuff, I mean the, the the state relies on fear. Um, that's the only way that you know that's that's how they can get away with mass surveillance. Uh, you know, upon the upon the entire citizenry, that's how they can do basically everything they do. That's why you know police officers can you know beat and kill people for whatever the reason they want to because you know. Uh, the person was they dangerous, scared. so to they speak. Home their family. Yeah, they, yeah, they, you know, the dog was going to bite them. They had to shoot the dog. You know, they could, they, <laughs> they couldn't, they could not go to the hospital and get stitches and just avoid killing the dog. You know, um, or oh. it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's all about fear. Um, it, it, it's all about fear. Um, and if, <clears throat> and obviously, it, it's all about fear. Um, but uh, it's about you know fear, like uh, I guess slave on slave violence, right? Um, as long as if the government commits violence, uh, you know, murders people over over in the Middle East, if uh, um, if they uh, you know um, kill college students at Kent State, whatever it is, any, any violence the government does is okay. Um, it's okay. Yeah. But as, as far as private citizens go, you know, if there if there's a uh, um, if there's uh, if if a civil, if a civilian kills a civilian with a gun, the world's going to end, and we need to ban guns. The world is going to end. Right. Hell's going to freeze over. Um, it, it's 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 just going to be a bad deal for everybody. But uh, uh, it's it's that's that's just how it is, you know. That that kind of uh, deterrence from um, the state's violence onto onto the onto the civilians. So um, it's it's um, mm, yeah, it's not it's not fun. <laughs> it's not not a fun situation that, that, to be in for, for for us average folks because the law the laws apply to the peasants, but don't apply to the uh, to the rulers. Mm-hmm. That brings to mind. I'm sure you're familiar with Eric Swalwell, Duke Nukem, but. He had, he, you know, the the quote that he's running on is he wants to take the most dangerous weapons out of the hands of the most dangerous people, and I think my most underrated tweet of all time, like last I checked, it was sitting at five likes. As I was like, so you want to take nukes out of the hands of politicians? Like yeah. the, the, the 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 politicians, the ones in charge of the government, they're the people who commit the most violence. They're, 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 I mean, not not only historically speaking, but like statistically speaking, they. they you know, they, they ra- ragtag entire countries in the name of 
uh, getting reelected or, uh, you know, lines on a map is all that it, it ends up being about to them. But mm-hmm. in terms of like, uh, you know, how that, how, you know, how, I guess, and maybe now we can loop back around to whatever my political views end up being. But I think that the only reason that government should exist is if it betters the the lives of you know the people around them. If it makes mankind better off. So so if you know at the end of the day everyone goes to sleep, they wake up the next morning, mankind's in a better place. Gotcha. And I don't see I don't see endless war in the Middle East as doing that. And for that reason, I think that all guns should be taken out of the hands of politicians. All politicians' ability to send young people over to die should be taken out of their hands because that's the most dangerous weapons. That's the most dangerous people. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, what was it? Um, I don't remember the exact number, but some 200, some 200 million people or 200 million civilians uh, murder or I guess, uh, you know, uh, civil, uh, citizens democided by their government in the 20th century alone. Like it's, it's a sure. ridiculous, staggering number. Um, you can't do that without, uh, you know, uh, without a central bank. You can't do that without, uh, you know, a, a, cent- a centrally, uh, you know, such a centrally controlled government like, uh, you know, what we have today. Um, it's just impossible. Um, it, it's 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 just complete and utterly impossible. Um, it costs a lot of money to do this shit. You've got to have fiat money. You've got to be able to, to to print as much as you possibly can to to get away with this stuff. Um, and just like with, with enforcement of a lot of these things, um, you know, taxes don't, you know. T- Taxes fund some of this stuff, but I think even like the, the income tax, and this is like the, I think it was 1983 Grace Commission report. Um, even even Ronald Reagan, as much as I despise that dude, um, he even you know he he said that he, he told the truth that every you know all the income tax is going to paying the interest on the debt. So like. <clears throat> they don't yep. fund this stuff through taxes, like a, a lot of it, like as far as the nope. federal governments, like obviously local government, you know, property, you know, property theft and all that stuff. Yeah, you know, maybe there's some stuff funded by funded by 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 uh, by, by theft station. But as far as um, all of the all of the federal government stuff, uh, no, that's that's uh, it's basically just you know print funded as much as you by can. borrowing money. Yep, yep, exactly, exactly. Um, so borrow money from people who don't have it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, I guess I guess an, a, a comment on uh, just a comment uh, regarding the Wired article um, that kind of uh, uh, that told your story. I, I thought it was really funny. Um, they said that you sound like a radical leftist for po- like for pointing out um, you know the murdering of civilians in, in, in foreign countries. Um, like you, well, he, he sounds like a radical rightist when it comes to guns, but he sounds like a radical leftist when it comes to when it comes to war. Um, <laughs> I just, I thought that was, I don't know, I thought that was hilarious. Uh, you know, I haven't been a big fan, big fan of Wired for some time, but, um, I don't know, I'm not really surprised, but I, I just, I, I just enjoyed that. It's, you can't just be a consistent advocate for freedom. You have to be, like, either on the left or you have to be on the right, um, which makes right. sense, which, I mean, it, it, it makes sense. I don't know why I'm complaining. I've complained about it plenty of times before. Uh, it's just, it's just kind of funny. So, um, I guess let's go ahead, um, yeah, great, great conversation so far. But I, I want to get into uh, into to, to kind of the, the the crux of the discussion here, which which is your story. Which, I mean, <clears throat> it's you're not again not surprising, but um, it's uh, you're you're in a very peculiar position. So um, you so I guess let's start from the beginning here. So you had you had you had your I uh, you know your Ivan uh, the Troll Twelve Twitter account, and uh, you you start uh, so. When did you start posting, uh, you know, gun videos or gun files, and, and how long did it take for uh, for you to garner the love and attention of uh, of one New Jersey state senator? So I started posting files. I guess I should take it back, so I can take it from the very start mm-hmm. just as easily. I think so. Sure. I made a Twitter account because that's where Cody was, and it seems like that's where like the, the the you know stuff was going down. And so I made a Twitter account just to, like shit post mainly. Mm-hmm. It's like you know, Co- Cody has his swarm of detractors, so I just want to like poke fun at them because I, I I get a kick out of making people mad. Uh, I'm not, well, of course, I'm a self-admitted Twitter troll, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's in your it's in your it's in your handle, yeah. <laughs> it's true. So so I had made the account as like a like a play on words of like you know the Russian bot thing. So yeah, you know, pick, pick pick my favorite Russian name, so Ivan, <laughs> and then pick you know I'm, I'm the troll. So. It's just a, I'm like a Russian troll from my Russian troll farm, except the message didn't get relayed to me. I'm supposed to pick an English name, so I'm Ivan the Troll. And I'm Ivan the Troll 12 because you need to put a number in there to make it official. So I basically just you know, shit posted on Cody's stuff, shared a couple pictures because at that point I was like you – know, at that, that point in my life I was like printing AR lowers like there was no tomorrow, like boxes of them because <laughs> you know, – because in my mind, you know, a gun buyback is going to happen eventually. Eventually, there'll be a gun buyback I can attend. 
and they're going to be t- buying assault weapons for like a hundred dollars a piece. Assault weapons in air quotes, of course. <laughs> and they're going to be paying like a hundred bucks a piece for them. I'm going to turn over boxes full of these lowers. I'm going to buy myself all sorts of nice guns. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Oh, I, I remember at, at, at some out. of those at some of those other gun buybacks. Uh, I, I think you mentioned. I think it was you that mentioned it. I'm pretty damn sure it was that you could uh, you could more affordably like spend eight dollars and go down to Home Depot and like build your own shotgun. Um, there were people at other gun buybacks that would that would that would go and you know like make like ten of those and get like what, what do they offer like 150 yeah. or 500 however much they offer and just you know sell those you know sell those and go buy real guns right <laughs> maryland had done like a high capacity magazine buyback and uh, of course you know you can print these glock mags of course because they wouldn't function test the mag of course and i've been working on these glock mags and again i guess I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit we'll explain more talk more about the glock mags later yeah sure but you know, they were saying they were given like fifty dollars for high capacity magazines, which is anything over ten is apparently high capacity to them. So cool, but you could print these magazines off for like two dollars a piece. <laughs> and unfortunately, I I had asked, you know, I, I tweeted at the Maryland Police Department, like, <laughs> is there any chance that these uh, you know, that someone from out of state could attend the buyback? And I said no, and I was like, damn, <laughs> I could have made so Anybody much in money, want to make a lot of money. <laughs> Right. I was thinking, like, I've got, you know, at that point I had, like, 20-something of these magazine bodies printed, like, $50 a piece. I'm going to go buy myself an FAL or something cool. Right. But unfortunately, no. So I guess getting back into my story. Man, I for, I've forgotten where I'd left off. I was shitposting. Yep. I'd shared a couple, yeah, I was, I was printing lowers like crazy. And so I shared a picture of, like, a couple lowers I was doing, and you know, people loved it. And I think that's when I met uh, in Carbonite, who's another another person, you know, brother of the faith, if you will. Mm-hmm. But you know, I, I'd met some of these people there, and, and it was like, you know, we're sharing share, share pictures of project, and I'm like, okay, cool, because I didn't realize that there were like spheres of 3D gun printers here on Twitter. And so I was like, you know, great, you know, I've sort of found a home. Like, you know, here's people who are interested in you know the survival stuff, like the collapsitarian folks. You know, they they they're they're cool to talk with and then over here you've got like like dedicated 3d gun printing circles and you know i I wasn't aware that such a thing was you know so active and so you know so such passionate members so he's like yeah yeah i've got a home here and once i'd seen that like other people are sharing you know more than just like pictures of lowers like they're they're posting completed builds and videos of them shooting the stuff i was like i'm gonna go right ahead you know you know i'll share some of that myself and so it's after I was doing that, uh, a guy, and I'll probably talk quite a bit about him tonight, but uh, a guy who now goes by Jay Stark, uh, whose first name is Jacob, uh, and he's not in a place that's the U.S. Uh, he's in the, the the gulags of Europe, Ooh. and uh, he was interested in you know the first the first first thing he did was he invited me to this group. That at the time was called Boomstick Consolidated, which was like a you know a play on Defense Distributed. Mm-hmm. So he invited me to Boomstick Consolidated, and it was just sort of like like the vibe I got of it, it was like a Defense Distributed fan club. And at the time, I didn't know that uh, Jacob was from Europe. I was just under the assumption that you know everyone here was like me, where they're Amerifags who were just following Defense Distributed. But you know, Jacob was just going crazy, direct messaging me, like, how good are you at CAD? Because, you know, I had made it evident, like, the lowers I was doing were, like, slightly modified lowers so that they'd be a little bit stronger, a little bit more to what it was that I wanted to use them for. So he was asking, like, you know, how, how good are you at CAD? And, like, you know, how good are you at fixing parts in CAD? And I was like, well, I'm good at it. Well, I'm pretty good at it. And I was like, and I just didn't get why he was asking all these questions. And so then he was saying a bunch of stuff like, you know, the, the bolt on the AR-15 assembly defense distributed just release is bad. Because this, this would have been like right you know, right before August. He was like, you know, the, you know, the bolt's modeled wrong. The firing pin couldn't even protrude past the firing pin hole in the bolt face. You know, at that point, I still didn't get it. I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I was like, you know, the, the CAD's bad. It doesn't really surprise me. Hard CAD is good to have. So, you know, I thought nothing of it. But uh, so Jacob, who had a Twitter at that point in time, uh, tweeted at Cody and said, you know, any reason why the bolt on this you know assembly you just released is garbage you know because you know, C- cody hypes it up in in the hoster pay video which is an excellent video by the way 
you know, he talks about like he's released the full technical plans for the AR-15 to the public domain. And it's like, oh, that's really cool. But uh, so long story short, and that cat assembly he posted was complete hot garbage. I mean, it's bad. And so I, and it's symbolic. The reason he posted it was symbolic because what it means is people will sue him for posting a bad assembly, which is an assembly made from parts that were floating around on GrabCAD. Right, yeah, and, and yeah. Can the, he, did, he didn't even, he, can he just took them from other outlets, right? Like, he took, he just took, like, for, yep, for that initial, yep. for that initial dump, I think there might have been, like, I think the Liberator Pistol was in there, but the rest of them, he just basically grabbed and just put up on, uh, just, just put them up there, right? <laughs> there were a couple parts that were made from scratch, and even in the host and pay video, whenever it shows, like, the AR-15 assembly exploding, and I love the fact that I've noticed this by now, but it is, is evidence of how bad that model was. So after Defense Distributed had you know, released that AR-15 model and Jacob had found the things that were wrong with it, well, specifically the one thing on the bolt, he called Cody out on Twitter and said, you know, why are you posting your bad files? And, you know, Cody's reason for doing that was because, you know, it, give, it gives him an argument because he's sharing files that are already out there as well as it gives him the argument of the files he was sharing aren't even good. You know, so if he has to fall back on something like these, you, you couldn't make a workable gun from those files even if you wanted to. It was it was bad. So uh, is like as in the hoster pay video, which I think is one of their uh, better videos. Uh, you can see whenever they're doing like the exploded diagram of the AR-15. You can see that that forward assist looks like it was modeled by someone who had never seen a forward assist on an AR. Because I mean, it's not even close to looking right. Really. Um, and, and and interestingly, if like if you go on GrabCAD and try to find an AR-15 forward assist assembly, there isn't one. No one has modeled one. So you can tell that's something that they modeled from scratch just to try and make it look right from you know externally, make it look correct. While internally, it wouldn't function as a forward assist, and it doesn't look like a forward assist. So you know, it's, it's, that's like an example of they, they wanted to start a fire by posting like AR-15 full CAD plans. They didn't really want the AR-15 full CAD plans to be out there because that's a massive undertaking. Right. So after Jacob called Cody out on Twitter, Cody was like, you know, in his classic Cody self was, you know, fix it yourself. So after after Cody told him fix it himself, uh, Jacob did. And so Cody hit up Jacob in the DM saying, you know, do you think you'd actually be able to fix the whole thing? Because Cody, you know, Cody acknowledged, like, there's stuff wrong with it. He, he knew that. People at Defense Distributed knew that. It's not like it was some great big secret. I mean, it was so, so bad that, you know, it'd be hard to miss. Any, anybody who's taken, like, a cross-sectional view at those files has seen it's bad. So Jacob was like, yeah, you know, totally I'd do it. And so Jacob came in and enlisted me. And it was after I had seen that that I sort of realized, like, oh, so that's the angle Jacob's going to take. Because it was about then that I learned that uh, Jacob's not from the United States. He's from uh, the gulags of Europe. Mm -hmm. So uh, given, given that, you know, I sort of started to understand, like, you know, this is important because, you know, maybe in some distant future, when it, if when metal 3D printing finds its way into the home, you'd be able to print. You know, nearly all of an AR-15 uh, using like an accurate CAD model of it. So the, you know the usefulness of this CAD model sort of becomes apparent to me, right? And, as well and as you know, like how broken, yeah, you know, and, how and broken for, for him. The defense distributed CAD model dawns on me too. Yeah, I mean, it makes complete sense why he was right. that why he was so interested, um, being being you know over in right. Europe. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not it's not an absolute necessity now, um, but the best the best time to uh, you know, build things is when you don't need them, right? Because uh, if 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 guns were right. banned, they were they're going to confiscate, and we were trying to figure all this shit out. Uh, you know, when that was happening, it'd be a bad deal, right? So, um, <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, it's 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 not absolute. Uh, I mean, as far as like three three like uh, like um, I mean, we'll, we'll get into that more later. As far as kind of um, the um, <clears throat> I guess being like a. a I guess when when we hit the time where three D printed guns can be used for self defense, right? Um, whenever, right. whenever whenever that happens. But yeah, go, go back at him. Sorry. So uh, I so I saw I saw the point, you know, but there's the point of you know there's people who don't have access to AR 15s who could benefit from having an accurate CAD model, as well as it was the realization of because you know I, I, I of course I assumed things would be wrong with defense distributed CAD model. 
I didn't realize that it was like disgustingly like not not good at all. Like Jacob just started started sending me like cross sectional views and like asking like is this right? Is this right? Is this right? And I was constantly like yeah no that's not supposed to be that way. Nope it's not supposed to be that way. And like big things like like if you if you put a magazine model the magazine into the correct location you know so a magazine seated in the lower receiver it clipped through the upper receiver really bad. It's like the top half an inch of the magazine was clipping through the upper receiver. Like, you know, so something's wrong. And so we were like wondering, is it the lower that's wrong? It's holding the mag at the wrong height. Is it the upper that's wrong? Is it the magazine that's wrong? And it essentially just became like a battle of that. Like we'd find where things were clipping or things just didn't line up right. And we'd be like, so what is it here that's wrong? So we fought the battle that way. Like, like I had taken, I, I've got several ARs, and so I had had you know, two of them, like a carbine and a rifle length, that were completely disassembled for, you know, nights and nights on end. Because we ended up working on this for about two months. You know, I was working nights after work or, work or school. He was working after his, uh, whatever, whatever work he was doing then. So, you know, we were working around, you know, actual jobs or whatever, trying to get things modeled up into the right shape. And so after about two months of that, I was probably averaging about four hours a day, you know, five days a week. So working about 20 hours a week on the AR model for about two months. And it was then that through one of the guys in the the Boomstick Consolidated group, which I think by that time, that two months in, we had switched the name to Deterrence Dispense. Like we were cycling through funny plays on words, like Boomstick Consolidated stuck around for a bit because it was funny. There was a couple other silly ones, but the Turns Dispense sort of stuck around for a long time. Like the group name didn't change from there. And so, you know, that ended up becoming the banner we rallied under, you know, for, for lack of a better one. But DD2. It was a bit. Right, right, DD2. But it was at that time that we sort of, uh, well, sorry, not, not that we sort of realized. It was at that time, about two months in, that another guy in that group passed us the full, like the technical data package, which for the uninitiated is like all the 2D machinist drawings, like you know, so two, two 2D drawings that a machinist would need to make the parts for an M16. So we had the, the technical data package for an M16A1 and some of the parts for an M16A2 passed to us. So it was obtained via Freedom of Information Act from the Army base in New Jersey, from Picatinny Arsenal in New Jersey. Really? Because the Army owns, because the Army now owns the M16 patent and intellectual property, and that took place. That, that you know that was finalized in the 90s. Whenever the Army, way 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 back when, like Vietnam era, signed the contract with Colt, it was you know Colt would make the first X number of rifles, and at that point. The army owns the patent, so the army says who owns. You know, so the army at that point says who gets to make M16s. So you know, it's no longer a Colt exclusive uh, deal. But you know, f- from there, the army year by year would own more and more of the intellectual property of the M16 as well. So at, sometime in the 90s, the army now owns the patents and the intellectual property. So that means that while this technical document is still, I mean, it may contain uh, cult trade secrets at that point. The Army can, uh, you know, the Army can spread it around if the Army deems it not containing cult trade secrets. And so evidently the Army didn't think that it contained cult trade secrets because they went ahead and spread it around. And you know, they were willing to give it out to people who Freedom of Information Act requested it. And that's, that's, so, so, ir- that's so ironic, man, that you got it from it, like uh, that, that, right. that this was acquired from a New Jersey, uh, you know, base, right? Yeah, so, so. Ironic that it was acquired from New Jersey and ironic that it was, uh, you know, given out by the government. But supposedly the army has like a long history of they don't really give a shit about ITAR when it comes to they'll spread around plans for old weapons. You know, it's just so long as you know who to ask at the army base. So I've got a a buddy who's in Belgium, a Belgian gunsmith, but he's managed a Freedom of Information Act request as a Belgian national. So he lives in Belgium. He's a Belgian citizen, not a U.S. citizen in Belgium, but a Belgian in Belgium has been able to request technical data from the army and have our army send it to him. Because, That's fucking you know, so crazy. They don't give a shit about ITAR, evidently. Or, or maybe they maybe they think that because he's a gunsmith, you know, ITAR doesn't apply to him. Or I think, you know, the most realistic situation is you know, like 2D CAD drawings of old guns. You know, the M16 is a six-year-old design, and he was requesting blueprints for designs older than that. 
I, th I think it was like the M15 uh, government officer, like a derivative of the 1911. But so, so like way, way old blueprints is what he was asking for. And he got them, you know, one way or the other. But, you know, this is all sourced from the army. So the army doesn't seem to be too keen, like or that or the army's like, yeah, we realize that, that you know, 2D plans, while, while ITAR says it applies to them, it doesn't really. And with the State Department changes, it doesn't apply to them. But right, regardless, it's ironic that New Jersey was giving out, you know, these plans originated from New Jersey. And I know in one, one of the packages for the AR, we have that cover letter of the Freedom of Information Act request, like where the Army guys signed off on it. And then in another package, we took, got rid of that slide in the PDF. And it was that, that was at the request of the guy who passed it to the guy who passed it to us. He was like, can you not include that one from now on? And we were like, sure, we don't know why. But if that's what he wants, he gets it. Right, yeah. So, but, but I mean, there, there are then, you know, versions of it out there that you can see. Like, the Army signed off on this, and on the letterhead it says, you know, like a Picatinny Arsenal, New Jersey, United States. So, and see, know, that's, there's that's, your damning proof. That's, it, it, this, this guy was a Belgian, like, okay, I will say, back in like 2014, I filled out a Freedom of Information Act. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, didn't know what office I sent it to, and they just, it was basically like, uh, it was... It was it was it was after this it was after this after the Snowden stuff. So I was, I, I I sent in like three three things, and one of them included like uh, any and all um, recordings or anything you've anything you've acquired from me. Um, you know, so I sent it to the NSA, and they kind of said, "Well, we can't confirm nor deny that um, we have anything. Um, all of your requests are denied." Um, so I just think it's right. funny that this this guy's a Belgian citizen, and like we're just like, oh, fuck it, why not send it over? Yeah. They'd send him sent him pages for the T forty eight, which for those that don't know is whenever the United States was trying to adopt our new rifle after the Grand, you know, like the decision was between the M fourteen and the FAL, and so we the the FAL we trialed the FAL under the name T forty eight, so it was the FAL in three hundred eight Winchester as we had been, you know, so it was going to be an M fourteen and three hundred eight Winchester or an FAL. And so after what many consider to be one of the biggest controversies in uh, U.S. Army like uh, weapons acquisitions, we chose the M14 over the T-48. So the T-48 went away, but the, you know, the Army still has the plans. Because Remington ended up making a couple T-48s, I believe. But you know, because of that, the plans are now something that the Army has. And... I think technically the FAL is still under patent. I believe the Belgians themselves still under patent for the FAL, but evidently the army doesn't even give a shit about patents because maybe they're going to say the T-48 isn't under that patent, but I'm pretty sure it's a patented, like a licensed version of the FAL. But whatever, yeah, man, it's, and, it's, and it's, I'm going to show my ignorance it's, it's, for licensing law. But <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like I said earlier, laws only apply to the peasants, man. They, they can do whatever the fuck they want to, and it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. Um, wait, 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 and I got us all, I got us off track too there. Uh, so, so, back to, so, so back to the story, because um, I, I think we're getting to, to kind of the crux of this, right? Um, you know, you're trying to come up with right. the, uh, the, with the, you know, the, the rifle design um, and all. So you were working through some stuff, you, 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 got, the, you got the 2D designs, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm guessing the next thing that yeah. happened was they were turned into three-dimensional, maybe? Yeah, once once you have that technical data package, because, you know, that, that's like the holy grail of if you want to draw a gun in CAD and you have the technical data package, it's like, you know, it's uh, one of the earliest things you learn in CAD drafting is you take 2D drawings and make them 3D. And so, I mean, we, we just went nuts over that. We worked about one more month. And then after that month, we were ready to get the files to Defense Distributed. And of course, you know, before that time, Cody had been arrested and Cody had got, you know, like next, you know, so, so I guess technically we knew Paloma would be in charge before you know, it was announced because Cody had given contact info for Paloma and for a guy over there named Garrett uh, to Jacob is like, a, you know, get the AR model to these guys. And the so, so we tried to follow up with Paloma and we essentially got like a response of check back with me in a month because, you know, she was super busy then. Oh, yeah. And so we tried following up with Garrett. And so I ended up sending on a USB flash drive the AR assembly to Garrett. But for whatever reason, and now I'm going to put on my tinfoil hat, I wonder if I was being monitored by the NSA or something. This flash drive, uh, you know, I mailed it USPS uh, to Texas. And it was in Texas for two days, didn't get delivered for either of those two days. 
and then it went to Florida, spent a week in Florida, then went back to Texas and got delivered. I don't know if maybe it's like a bug in the tracking thing or no, no idea. I don't know if it's like USPS doesn't have their shit together or what. I paid for two to three days shipping and it took like a week and a half, but whatever. But by the time it had gotten there, New Jersey had signed their, or New Jersey's legislature had passed that bill that banned you know, advertising about firearms. Because if you remember during this time, uh, Defense Distributed was selling the firearms plans on yes. Blueprint or on USB drives mm -hmm. yep. to US citizens. And then, so they'd stopped doing that after New Jersey's legislature passed, approved the bill. So the governor still had to sign it into law. But after the their legislature passed the bill, Defense Distributed stopped sending USBs. And so I think we missed it by a week. So if it, the two to three day shipping had worked, then they would have at least been able to like review our file off of the flash drive. But unfortunately, you know, things got stopped there. Jesus, dude, so, like that's, wow. <laughs> like the, the, the timeline was so close there, wasn't it? Oh right. my gosh. In, yeah, in, I, in and see, like, unbeknownst so, to us. I, I right. understand like USPS is a government monopoly service. They are super in debt um, to deal with the, the long wait lines. They removed the clocks. They didn't, you know, try to up the right. up the up the service or anything. Um, but I've ordered, I, I I ship and order a lot of stuff, and it's delivered through USPS. And I have never, and I mean, I'm only 27, but like, let's say like the past 10, 15 years, I have never seen an, an anomaly like that where it just gets like lost, like n not like <clears throat> I don't think I've ever had anything lost either, but like where where it's supposed to go to Austin, Texas, but it just somehow ends up in Florida. I, and I mean, it showed up in Austin. Like two days, the tracking information was Austin out for delivery, and then it was in Florida. So I, I don't know if like it was sorted. I imagine what really happened is it was sorted wrong. But like in the it back was, of my it was mind, there was like this anxiety probably, growing of. Yeah, I mean, the the, the simplest, exp the simpler explanation is probably is, is probably what what happened. Um, I don't remember what's uh, there, there's Hanlon's razor and there's there's there, I don't the epistemological razor. I don't remember which one it is, but the simpler explanation is probably what what happened. Um, right. But I mean, it's you never know, man. I mean, it's it's I don't know. There, nothing happens by coincidence. Right. But, you know, eventually it found its way to them and they had said, you know, it looks good. Everything that was like that they knew to be wrong with the other AR, they said, you know, it was fixed. But unfortunately, now they can't send it out. And for a second there, it looks like they're going to have a window where they could ship the USBs, you know, because they, they, they asked Gray Wall to specifically answer, can we still send these USBs? Because Washington State said that we could you know, send these files on USBs. And then Gray Wall's like, you're going to have to be more specific about what files it is that you want to share. It's like, really, shut the fuck up. I hate, it just makes you hate politicians so much. Like, his official letter back was, you know, what files are you talking about specifically? You know what files. Really? Right, yeah. They've been in the media for what, the past, like, they're, you, they've been in the media for the past, what, right. like, a month? The, the, this has been, like, like Donald, you're you, suing you, us over. Dol, Dolan J. <laughs> Tramp tweeted about it. You know, these files, uh, the right. ones that are, have been in, you know, mainstream media for this long? Really? <laughs> that was just one of those, well, great. So then we knew that the files wouldn't be shared for, you know, some time. And we wanted them to, like, get the files in FOSCAT or just, like, post them somewhere to get them shared around because, you know, it's a fixed AR assembly. And we'd really like that to be out there for as many people as possible because, you know, originally there was, like, a talk of a contract with Defense Distributed that, you know, the money they were making selling the files would get a cut of or one thing or the other. And you know, money was never a motivator to me. I enjoyed doing this stuff. You know, I, I could be playing video games or I could be being productive and you know, drawing an AR-15 in CAD. I'd draw the AR-15 in CAD. Forget mm -hmm. video games. Right. And I, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare propose to be paid money to play video games. So it's not, it's not like it was like some big. I want to get paid or else I'm going to be upset. So, you know, so we didn't mind releasing the files for free. But the the problem, you know, the the flag I raised was. We need to make sure that these files are not now technically defense distributed because we like mailed it to them and they opened them and looked at them or whatever. Like, you know, we need to make sure that that line isn't drawn anywhere because now if we're sharing a file that belongs to defense distributed in right. such a strange way, you know, we, I, I didn't, I didn't want to bring legal trouble down on them inadvertently as well as yeah. tie myself up in it, which they've, would be bad. So. They've, got, they've, they've, they've always had enough to deal with anyway. <laughs> right. So we, we did get clearance, like Paloma, I guess, I don't know, Paloma cleared it with the lawyers, and Paloma just said, fuck it, there's no contract signed, you guys do what you want. So we did end up sharing the AR-15 CAD assembly that way, and that was really the, f well, technically that wasn't the first file I post. 
I posted. So after, so there was a big gap between we finished the AR in New Jersey, signed that law, and we posted the AR-15 CAD assembly. Because we didn't post the AR-15 files until February 23rd, which I remember because it's 223, so the English chambering for the AR-15 is 223 uh, Remington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we released it on because I like mixing numerology into it. I've been told that's silly and stupid, but I think it's kind of funny. So we mixed a little numerology in there because that day was coming up anyway. So before that, I think it was... Let's see. I put so much time and energy into this, and I don't even remember when I released it. But one of my projects, you know, after we had finished the AR of our three months of working on the AR, the next project I took up was... Uh, Defense Distributed 3D Printable AR-15 mag has like a long history in FOSCAD circles as well as like to anybody else who's interested in printing guns of it doesn't work the way that Defense Distributed showed it working or the way that they said it would work. And so it's – it's in my one argument with Defense Distributed, love what they do. Uh, you know, the legal battles would not would be lost immediately if not for their help. But when it comes to releasing files, I mean would it hurt them to just do a little bit of documentation? I don't know. Like, they released the AR-15 files with no documentation. Like, their readme was nothing if anything. Like, you know, no, no recommended materials, no recommended printers, no print settings, no post-processing op- you know, information, nothing. They just released the CAD file. So, so um, I'm sorry. Let, let me so, let me let me step in here real quick. Just just um, I, I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to cut you off again. But <clears throat> so as far as uh, like, if you order a Ghost Gunner, they send you a bunch of these flash drives and stuff with it. You know, the the, the software that goes along with with the Ghost Gunner, right? So is it really? Uh, and maybe I don't know if you have a Ghost Gunner or not. But so is I don't know. Like the the, the claim that's made is that you get one of these Ghost Gunners. You install the software, you hit print, and you have the magazine, you have the lower, wh- whatever it may be. Um, is it really not that easy? So, no, I don't, I don't want to slander anything about the Ghost Gunner. So the Ghost Gunner, okay. from what so I understand, that, okay. is completely, it can, it's completely exempt from any of what I'm saying here. Okay, good so this deal. this specifically deals with, like, any file that meant for 3D printing that they released. They didn't want to, like, like part orientations, like the most basic thing. Like, how do you, what orientation do you want to print it in? I mean, you couldn't find anywhere what orientation they said they printed it in. Okay, like good. And I, 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 fi- I figured, I figured that in. was, I figured that'd be the answer. Um, but I, I just wanted. I'm sure some listeners were were thinking, well, right? For, for clarification, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no. The the ghost gunner is good to go. But I think it was just because a lot. Of, I mean, all the printable files they put out were like early. Like I think t- 2013 was when the Fed shut them down, right? I think these these so these files it's like these files have been up there from like 2000 like it's been like er, early to mid 2000 they've been up forever basically like they they they've been up um yeah right so they've been up nonstop but like you know they 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 had developed these files like pre 2013 so they'd really only barely just got the ball rolling so it's not like I fault them or accuse them of malice whenever I say that they uh, you know they don't document things well because I'm sure you know they they've changed that practice for the ghost gunner without a doubt mm-hmm. but. It's like, you know, this AR-15 magazine, you know, they'd showed it working. They showed it working like doing a full auto mag dump with it. But no one in FOSCAD, and there, there's people, you know, smarter than me, better than me in FOSCAD. Uh, and not, no one had been able to get this AR-15 mag working right in there. And so some people had like, you know, like their conspiracy theories were defense distributed, like faked the video. Like that's just like a white dyed PMAG or something. You know, some people were saying like, that was a fluke or they used some expensive laser centering nylon printer to print the mag or, you know, there's, there's some gimmick going on there or like that, like, you know, they casted it out of a Lumulite or something. So, so a couple of theories that were FOSCAD had assumed was the case because you can't just print one. You can't print it in any material FOSCAD had tried and expect it to work, you know, more than one or two mag dumps, if that. So I decided I was going to take my own stab at that. And so I, you know, basing off of uh, Defense Distributed's initial files, I had found that the strongest material that mo- that a cheap 3D printer can print in is DuPont Zytel, which is just like a high-strength engineering nylon. It's really good stuff. I like it. It's expensive. It's like $100 a kilogram, which is fairly fairly expensive for consumer, like a hobbyist 3D printer stuff. Sure. But, the, I mean, it's, it's quite strong. And uh, long story short... 
the, the mags want to crack on like the rear of the lips at the top of the magazine is where it always wants to crack. And so I had found that, and the way I found this was kind of accidental, but I was trying to like use a set, you can use in a soldering iron, like you can engrave in printed plastics. And so I was like sort of like etching engraving, just like messing around on a magazine that had already cracked one of its lips off. And so I was sitting there looking at like the busted off lip, sitting there melting. I don't even know what I was doodling into the magazine with a soldering iron. But I was sitting out there looking at it. So I took the cracked off lip, held it in place, and used the soldering iron to sort of like weld it back in place. And so then I, you know, I let it cool and I was prying on the lip and the lip felt like it was you know, stuck back in place. So I figured, you know, what the heck? This magazine was broken a second ago. Now it's not acting like it's rigid again. So I put a spring in it, you know, put all the peripherals back in the magazine and then loaded it up to 30 rounds and it held 30 rounds down without cracking again. And I went, holy shit, you know, I've discovered something here. So it turns out in like industrial circles, that's called polymer heat welding. And it's like a thing. And I didn't, re I didn't really discover anything new. I just found an application for it in, re in relation to uh, 3D printing. So that, that ended up being the secret to solving the strength issue with the 3D printed AR magazines is you have to use a high strength nylon like Zytel and you have to use a soldering iron to like fuse the top layers around where those where that crack usually forms. And I've got like four or five hundred rounds through one of those magazines now. I mean, yeah. You know, that's so, so long as you don't abuse the mag, it doesn't make it invincible like a P mag. P mags are so so tough. It's not quite that level of strong, but it's you know it's reusable, and that's that's what matters. It crosses right. that bridge. So I, do I documented that process. I shared like this is where you need to solder the magazine with pictures and I circled the areas and colored the areas that you need to do. You run a soldering iron over a Sharpie, like make my results as repeatable as possible. Cause that's what I care about. I don't care about, oh, I don't want to say I don't care about it, but it seems like Cody's main care is that this information is out there. Like, the files are out there and they'll never be taken away. My main interest is in, I want to see lots of other people repeat my exact results. Yes. You know, it's like a more of like an engineering scientific curiosity. Like it's like a, Here's my research paper. Can you confirm it? So along with that, the first file, that ended up being the second file I posted. We're sort of working backwards here. The, the second file I posted was like the fixed AR-15 magazine body. And I did end up having to do some like geometry tweaks inside the magazine. Like I, I made the, the, the guides inside of it. I made shaped and profiled like the guides in a PMAG. I don't know why they weren't shaped that way from the get-go. I'm sure there's a reason. But like it didn't want to feed, the magazine wouldn't want to feed reliably whenever you printed it on any FDM printer. Like the FDM or like the, has the hot end and it squirts out the hot plastic style printer, which, you know, most hobbyists, it's all that they can end up affording is an FDM printer. But on any FDM printer that I had seen the Defense Distributed QMO mag printed on, it didn't want to feed nice. So I moved the guides so it would feed a little bit better. And so that was the second file I released. The first file I released was, as a, you know, as a result of our making the AR-15 CAD assembly, we had an accurately modeled AR-15 magazine spring. So I took that magazine spring, and I, 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 you know, I modeled in CAD like a jig that sits inside of that magazine spring. And so then I did a subtractive edit. So wh wherever the coils in the magazine spring were, I subtracted that material from this jig that was sitting inside the spring. So then whenever you take that cat assembly of just the jig on the inside, it has like the coil, it's like a little half circle cut all the way around the outside of it. That's like the grooves of where you would put a magazine spring. So the idea there is then you can take spring wire and wrap it around this jig. And now you've shaped an AR-15 magazine spring. So my idea there was, is now you can make an AR-15 magazine completely from scratch because before you had to like source that spring from somewhere. And Defense Distributed Solution was you would take 10 round magazine springs and just use a coupler. So you take three 10 round springs and use two couplers and then that works as your 30 round magazine spring. My solution is like universal. You don't even need a 10 round AR-15 magazine spring. You just need spring wire. So something that would be impossible to ban like spring wire and now, now you need a, you know, a spring wire and a 3D printer and you can make yourself this spring. Ah. So I documented that process as well. And the, the, you know, the, the only downside to it is there is heat treating involved because you have to stress relieve that bent up spring. But you know, aside from that, you're good to go. 
So that was the first file I released, and I, I named that uh, Spring Bending Jig after our friend Graywall from New Jersey. Because right about that time, New Jersey <laughs> implemented their 10-round magazine ban for everyone but the police. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> and they're exempt from laws. You think the enforcers of laws should have to obey them? Get back to work, peasant. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, so let's. So, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the climax of the story. So, you, you start posting these files on on uh, on your now perma band account. Um, where are we next? Where are we next? Right. So, jumping back to the you know 223, we released the AR15 CAD files as well as you know it, we made the last minute decision that we were going to put the technical data package itself in there as well. And you know, at first, we were like worried like. If Colt finds out, is Colt going to be upset? Because I don't know if Colt knows that the Army distributed this information. I don't know if Colt knows that Colt, you know, if, if the Army knows that they've shared Colt's potentially trade secret information. So, you know, we were worried for a second, but then we realized, like, if anything, the Army is the one that screwed up. Right. And they're the one that are going to take the heat from this. And as well as, you know, it's like a 60, it's, I mean, you know, a 60 year old blueprint package that we shared i don't think anyone's going to be upset that it leaked i'm sure colt knows that it's leaked and i'm sure colt business people have done a like a cost benefit analysis that said we're going to lose money should we go and sue people trying to get control of this information back mm -hmm. and so that's why that, and that's why the blueprints were able were able to find their way to us anyway so we, we distributed that blueprint with the cat assembly which in the industry that's called a complete reference model Whenever you have your blueprints with your machining instructions and your CAD model accurate and dimensioned in assembly. So we released that. And it was fairly well received. There was like a couple threads on like AR15.com. There's a thread on M4 Carbine, you know, people talking about it. As well as like a bunch of idiot FUDs who were like, uh, Defense Distributed already released this information. And it's like, you know, part of you wants to like make an account and be like, no, you're a complete idiot. If you if you had bothered to open the file Defense Distributed put out, and if you had bothered to take you know even a bit, you know, like a minorly close look at it, you'd realize that their file was bad. But you know, just just people being fuds because they're idiots and have to sound smarter than everyone around them. Like, I oh, know these files have been out there forever. You no, didn't. They haven't. You didn't do any. You didn't do anything. What are you talking about? Right. <laughs> Right, as you're, well as you're, you're trying, you're trying was, to, you're trying to take credit for their work. <laughs> of course, of course, there was like some super fuds, like like the fuds who are also boomers, who were like, this 3D CAD stuff no good to me. It'd be much better if they released the 2D machinist drawings. Despite the fact that we released the machinist drawings and called it a complete reference model, then in parentheses, CAD model plus blueprints. So I, I don't know what the disconnect there was. I guess Grandpa forgot his glasses or something. We didn't type in all caps. That's what the problem was. Uh -huh. Couldn't read it. But <laughs> so it, it, like there, there was a lot of people, and, and I guess it's just something. I have a hard time understanding stupid people. I, I wish that everyone was less stupid. But like you can't, you can't take this gift and accept it. And then there was one guy in M4 Carbine that was like, are you sure this is legal? And I was like, do you give a shit? <laughs> uh, do you ask this question for everything posted on this forum there bud right it's like and i'm sure he does i'm sure he sees a picture of like the the notched hammer like the, the m16 hammer and someone's ar-15 and goes shawty that's illegal you're gonna go to jail that's just, illegal yeah, son that kind of... <laughs> you, don't want, you know what you don't want to break the law yeah <laughs> like, yeah, yes those, those yes kind of people yes what do you what do you mean i mean yeah what do you mean? Yeah, it's against the law. Whatever. <laughs> Those people managed to push my buttons and grind my gears, which will lead into our next project. But you no, know, it'll lead into our next project and the project after that even. But it was after we had released that CAD assembly that Menendez, probably via one of his lackeys, uh, saw the download. And I'm sure, you know, gets very up in arms and worried about such things because, oh, look, you know, the... <laughs> It's a quote from an old video game, but I'm sure it's. You know, I learned it from a video game. I'm sure it's older than that, but it's like a. It's a. It's like a rich, pompous guy saying, "Oh, look, the peasants are revolting. Get it, revolting." Mm -hmm. Right. You know, Menendez sees this and goes, "Oh no, these people are exercising their rights. We can't allow this to happen." So, 
as he, he's devising his battle plan while we're working on our next project, which is a, a bunch of people after we released the AR-15 package, because I, I guess people don't realize it was never meant to be 3D printable, at least not with our current technology. We said that in the readme of the file saying, you know, this isn't printable. This doesn't mean you can print an AR-15. If you have a very, very, very expensive 3D printer, yeah, you actually can print an AR-15. But oh, hold, if you've hold got on. that much money... You okay, that's that's going to be another question. I want to hammer in on that point. Let's not forget that. That's... Uh, okay, go ahead. Okay. So it, it was... So we didn't really make anything 3D printable, like new 3D printable there. We just released an accurate reference model. So if you wanted to base a printable gun design on an AR-15 platform... Here's your starting point. You know, every, you know everything here. You can trust everything here is good because we've also included the blueprints that Colt was using to make thousands of these guns. You know, mm -hmm. all through, throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s. You know, so so you know that these blueprints are good. That that's all that this was. And we just we disclaimed that in the tweet that we announced the release in. We disclaimed that in the readme of the files. It's like you know we specifically said this is not printable. If you print this. You will hurt yourself if you try to fire it. Like if you print this in plastic, it's not good. If it fires, it will hurt you. Right. Because a, a, a thin profile plastic barrel holding a 223 just isn't going to go well. I don't know that it would hurt you so much as it will blow up and it'd be funny to watch. So it's, it's like a, you know, this isn't printable. It's a reference model. And a lot of people didn't get that. Like a lot of people were like, how are they making the barrel on a printer? And it's like, can you read? You're not making the barrel. It's a reference model, Grandpa. Do you understand? <laughs> and, um, I, you know, and, and I'm not sure. Like, are these people fuds? Like, where they're so old, they just don't understand that? Or, or, you know, or maybe they're intentional idiots and they're just pressing my buttons and they're doing a really good job of it. Maybe they're so maybe they're, sort of maybe they're trolling this, the troll. Although, if it's boomers, this is they, true. They, they could don't, be. I don't know if I don't know if I don't know if that's. <laughs> I don't know if boomers troll, but I don't, I don't know. Maybe there's one and, or two. And I imagine all of and I imagine all of them have like an old grandpa voice, and they address everyone as Sunny. But <laughs> in, anyway, the, I, I started calling these people "but what abouters" because they're like, "Well, but what about the barrel? Are you printing that out of plastic? I don't think a plastic AR barrel is going to work very well." So I, I refer to them. You know, they're, they're, you know how, how are you making the boat? But what about the boat? You going to print the boat? Like. So, so they're what they're they're called, but what abouters to me? And it's like, but what about this? But what about that? But what about this? And it's you know the, the reason they have these problems is because they can't read. So right. we move on from there. In our next project, we decide we're going to do something printable. So we're going to do something that you know people can use because the big drawback to the AR-15 is it's neat. It makes the AR-15 an idea. Like you know the AR-15 as an idea, as an accurate dimension model, is now out there on the internet forever and ever and ever. Like, like as an actual accurate dimensioned one because the Defense Distributed claimed they put it in the public domain. We did it for real with accurate dimensions and with Colt's actual blueprint package, which is huge. Mm -hmm. I think the blueprint package was really more valuable than the CAD even though we put so, so, so much time into the CAD. That's only really useful if you're interested. If you have a very expensive 3D printer, it's useful to you. Or if you're interested in designing your own gun around the AR-15, it's incredibly, it's like invaluable to you then because it saves you a lot of time and making all that CAD yourself. Okay, I'm, 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 so, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to jump. I, I, I just, I, I want to, like, this is such an important question. Um, and it's, it's something I've heard, like with, with, uh, when I interviewed Cody, um, it, it's just something I see all the time. Um, and sorry, we're, we're going to get through the story guys, I promise. Um, so you, you said that, what you released on like an average 3D printer, um, you can't print you can't print that rifle. But if you have a really expensive yep. one, you can. Can you speak to that? I mean, like, what what are we talking about price wise? Um, can, can you give us so a, like a, a model number? Five hundred k to a million. Jesus Christ. Okay, so it's not even worth. That's okay. Right, so I'm, so I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking like really expensive. Like, like a GE would have such a printer. Uh, Boeing and Lockheed would have such a printer. Any, anybody who's like aerospace has such a printer. Otherwise, they don't have such a printer. Okay, so it's so it's possible, but um, it's it's not really worth discussing for 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 the average folk right, right. now. At okay. least at least ten years, in my opinion, it's at least ten years. Okay. Of course, then Very again, uh, well, the machines that are out there that are five hundred to five hundred k to a million dollars, or I mean, they're big volume. You don't need big volume to make a gun, so we'd see. 
I think because there's a company that sold an entirely 3D printed 1911. Solid Concepts was selling these printed 1911s for like eleven thousand dollars a gun, which is a, a joke. Because, of course, then again, you I bet you. Well, the problem is boomers hate 3D printing, but boomers love 1911s. I wonder if you could trick them into buying one. Like, funny, I paid eleven thousand dollars for this 1911. And they, they're printing them out of titanium. And titanium is fairly good at being a 3D printed metal. It, it behaves well. So, so that's, that's the difference you know, the is you're, you're using, um, like for, for the, for the um, sorry, to cut you off, sorry to cut you off and I feel bad about it. Um, so so, um, so with, the, with, I guess, the, the, the 3D printers that your average person could, um, um, could use and, you know, print magazines and such, um, those, are, um, those are, you know, probably very, very um, structurally sound plastics. Um, whereas on these very expensive, very expensive printers, you can actually do some 3D printing of metals. Yeah, usually they're like metal dedicated. Okay. So all they can do is, and, and I guess I'll give a quick rundown because uh, it, it's it's worth explaining, even though this gets us farther off topic. It's fine because it's That's, important. It's okay. It's so, okay. but most home three D printers are what's known as FDM, which is fused deposition of material. They're also called like FFF, which is fused filament fabrication. There's also another name for them. And you'll see this throughout 3D printing. Like everyone wants to have their own special name for them, for the different kinds of printers. But it, well, FDM works like if, if you can picture a hot glue gun that a computer moves around. Like it, it squeezes a hot stick, it squeezes a stick of plastic past the hot part on the printer. And then as it moves around, it puts that hot plastic down in a shape and then that plastic cools and it's hard again. So just like if you took a hot glue gun and you squeezed it, you had a computer squeeze the trigger and move the gun around, the hot glue gun around, and it would lay that you know, the hot glue down layer after layer. That's really all a FDM printer is. You know, as simple as can be, it's a hot glue gun controlled by a computer. The next, uh, the next, probably the next most expensive tier of printers are SLA printers, and they work by taking like a photosensitive resin, which sounds like a cool sciencey word, but all that really means is it's a liquid that turns to a solid when you shoot it with an ultraviolet laser or expose it to any ultraviolet light. So you shine it with, you zap an ultraviolet laser on this vat of liquid, and then you increase, well, you, well, you don't really increase the, uh, I, I guess when explaining it to layman, you just increase the height of the liquid in there by a little bit and then zap, zap that layer of liquid, then increase the height of the liquid in the tank and then zap that. And so then you build apart that way by solidifying layer after layer of this liquid. The problem with those printers, it's hard to make strong parts with SLA, but the advantage to SLA is because you're, you're fusing a liquid, your layer height can be so incredibly small that SLA parts are sometimes hard to identify as 3D printed because the layers are so thin. So SLA is like good for prototyping and good for parts that don't look printed, but it's not really great for strength. And for that reason, it never hasn't really caught on for like home use because it's more for like decorative stuff. So like the next higher tier, and some of the earliest 3D printers were this way, are what's known as powder bed. And so the way that works is it lays down like a powder, and I think sometimes it's like a ceramic -y powder. You know, the types of powders vary greatly. So it'll do one whole layer where it lays out pow powder across the layer, except in certain spots where it puts like granulated plastic, like ground up plastic. And then there's a laser at the top of the printer that shoots that granulated plastic and melts it into one layer of just plastic. And then it does another layer of where it puts powder where there's not plastic and then puts plastic where there isn't powder. And then it zaps that and then you build up layer by layer like that. So some of the earliest metal printers took that way that that powder bed works, except instead of plastic, you lay down a powder of metal instead of like a laser that you could like maybe boil water with. It's a laser that you could like nuke water with, like a, a laser that's hot enough to like flash weld metal. So the laser zaps the metal and then pow, your metal becomes a liquid and then quickly cools to become a solid. So layer by layer, you make your metal like that. And that's probably uh, it's one of the earliest ways of 3D printing metal. There's a couple different ways of doing it. And there's like 12 different acronyms that so mm -hmm. like the three primary ways are uh, so that, that way that it is described, which is like a powder bed for metal. There's also binder jetting, which is when you, well, so you, binder jetting and th there's a technique that's now you can like 3D print on an FDM machine 
works the same way, where it's like you have a plastic mixed with a, pow a metal powder. And binder jetting is you use like an inkjet printer that works in three dimensions, where it just lays out the blobs of uh, ink. But, and, but I shouldn't say ink. You, you lay out the blobs of plastic mixed with this metal powder in the correct shape as you go up and up in layers. Whereas there's also an FDM way to do that, where your spaghetti of FDM filament feeding in is metal powder mixed with the plastic filament. So then the way that binder jetting and the FDM part work is after you've printed the part, you melt out that plastic, and then you'll center that part in like a kiln. But then the problem becomes, you know, so you need a kiln, so it's still not cheap to do it that way, as well as after you melt that plastic out, you've got a metal part that's like mostly hollow. Well, not mostly hollow, it's like 60% hollow. Mm -hmm. And so usually what you do is you melt in brass to fill that hollow point or that hollow part. So you have a 3D printed like stainless steel part, but 60% of that is brass and 40% is stainless steel. So it has a stainless steel skeleton, but it's still full of brass. So it doesn't, it makes fairly strong parts, but not really strong enough that you'd want to be making guns out of them. Okay, so, so let, me, let, me, let, me step in, let me step in for, for, for one second here. So it sounds like, it, like we're, you're kind of walking through the, uh, kind of going from the, the lower end to the higher end. It sounds like once you, once you kind of get into the metals, it's uh, like at least the lower end uh, metal, metal 3D printers, um, it's still, uh, you're still printing plastic, but you're reinforcing that, uh, you're reinforcing the powder part with metal. Is that correct? Um, there's, there's still plastic in, plastic in what you're printing, but it's just reinforced with uh, some sort of metal? So in this binder jetting and uh, an FDM, I'm, I'm, I'm going to call it from now on, I'll call it Filament, because the, the company that's making it calls it Filament, which is like this 3D printable, 3D printable FDM plastic that's mixed with the metal powder. So the way those techniques work is you, know, you make your part where it's like a plastic metal mix. And you know the advantage there is the plastic holds the metal powder where it needs to be as you're building your part, and then you melt that plastic out. So now you've got like a fragile, sort of metal-filled skeleton left behind. And then you melt in extra metal to fill the gap that was left by the plastic. Mm, okay, okay. It, it's kind of a, it's, it's like a complex convoluted way to do it, and it's not really a great way to do it. it it's metal printing, but you know, not, not ideal for making guns. So for example, if you're familiar with Shapeways, they're like a service where you can send them a model file and they'll send you back your printed part. That's how Shapeways makes their metal parts is they'll, I, I think what they're doing is binder jetting where it's, it's a, so it's a metal, me, metal flakes mixed in with a droplet of plastic that they lay out and make your part with. Then they melt out the plastic, and then they melt bronze in to fill where the plastic used to be. And so they'll mm. sell you a bronze stainless steel mix part, which is fairly strong. It's not like it's a bad alloy, even though it's not really an alloy. It's just a mix of metals. And it'll be fairly strong, but I don't know that I would – I mean, you could not make a gun barrel out of it, for example. It wouldn't hold up. Sure, sure. So, so let me, let me step in for just one second for for for, for the listeners here, um, and then basically, basically just say, uh, so so here at the Volney Podcast, a lot of episodes are, are, are longer ones, and uh, we don't make money off of this, so we, uh, you know, we we kind of just uh, we we nerd out when it comes to to this sort of stuff. So, um, anything crypto anarchy, basically anything Vaughn, anything crypto anarchy, we we kind of geek out about it. So, uh, we're getting to a lot of nuance. Uh, and for some folks, you know, they, they want, some folks just want to hear like, you know, the story concise, you know, from zero, zero to 30 minutes done. Um, not going to happen here. We're, we're going to, we're going to have a conversation and discussion <laughs> and, uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to really, really try to figure we're, we're, we're going to try to solve the world's problems tonight, Ivan. Um, kidding, but, uh, we're, 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 we're going to, we're, we're going to do that. We're, we're going to do this kind of a, kind of, kind of long form. So, um, all right. So <clears throat> have you gotten to the, uh, like the GE printers yet or like the, the, the Boeing printers or are we still working our way? Yeah. They're, they're like the, the final tier, so I don't know how much I can admit, but I know that the industry uses all of the techniques for metal printing that are available to them because you know, they're willing to find whatever works. But like the, 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 the highest tier of all the, the printers is what's known as like DMLS, which is direct metal laser centering. It's also called DLMS, which is direct laser metal centering. So it's direct metal laser centering or direct laser metal centering. Again, it's like two acronyms that mean the same thing. And then there's one that's like LM something, something, something. That means the same thing. And what this technique is, is it's 
lays out a layer of powder with nothing but metal, metal powder. So they're like, there's no, it's like powder bed has like the non-metal powder mixed with the metal powder. DMLS just has this metal powder that you zap and that makes one layer of a metal part and then one layer of powder on top of it that you zap and makes a metal part. And so the advantage there is it, DMLS offers the strongest metal part that you can 3D print is essentially what I'm getting to. Mm-hmm. And the problem is, is it also ends up becoming the most expensive but it also offers then you know the most wide range of materials that you can uh, print on it. You know the most metal, widest range of metals you can print on it. But it's like the um, uh, biggest upper echelon of what what you can 3D print metals with is DMLS. So it will leave you with the strongest possible part left behind. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So, so I guess, and this is just a, a curiosity. I'm, I'm curious. Um, like I've seen some of the, uh, you know, kind of some of the desktop 3D printers. Um, you know, some of them are, some are decent sized. Um, you know, like uh, I'm not going to give a dimension, but you know, they're they're decent sized. How, how big are the printers? How big are the 3D printers you're talking about when it comes to like uh, these these uh, these higher end ones? Like what 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 size are they? Are they like a massive CNC machine, like that sort of size, or 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 like where you can do a, a you know a, a, where you can CNC a full full rifle? I mean, um, how big are these things? If you know, so a monster sized a monster sized metal printer is five cubic feet. There's a company in North Dakota that sells like custom built DMLS printers, and I know of one that they sold that was five cubic feet, and I think it was a two point five million dollar printer for five cubic Jesus. feet of metal printing capability. Oh my god. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and then to give you an idea, and then to give you an idea, like metal powder is not cheap, as well as if you want to use you because you want to use like pure virgin metal powder, so it's it's only the metal that you want. And it's very, you know, consistent grain size. So that way you get a very consistent print. Such things are not cheap, especially whenever you want to use, you know, pick a fancy alloy. If it's like a Inconel, if you want to use like high, you know, high certain high strength aluminums. 3D printing in aluminum, I should also mention, is very hard. Like in the milling world, milling aluminum, easy peasy. 3D printing world, printing aluminum is very, very difficult because aluminum doesn't like to get hot and then cool off quickly as well as aluminum powder, wants to explode more than it wants to melt. Hmm, okay. Uh, it, it wants to do like a little thermite reaction, sort of. But, so it, it tends to want to explode more than it does melt nicely. Mm-hmm. So printing aluminum is difficult. But there are certain blends of aluminum that don't explode when you shoot them with a laser, which is nice, so you can print with those easily. Otherwise, you have to use like you print in a vacuum or use certain inert gases to keep it from it blowing up. Like I think some, I think you can print in krypton gas. No. Mm. Ar- argon. It's argon. I think. I think you want to print in argon. Krypton doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. Or argon. Okay. <laughs> can you tell it? Can you tell I've been at work all day? Yeah, it's argon. You want to print in argon? Sorry. Well, this 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 krypton, is a lot. This sounds made up. This is a lot of shit to keep, you know, keep straight in your head, man. I don't, I don't, I don't, right. it's, it, and then, you know, we're human beings and, you know, we, we make mistakes, especially after, you know, a long day, a long day of work and such. So, um, is, is there, is there, is there anything else in regards to, um, I guess uh, this is this su- super, like, cause when we're talking about, um, <clears throat> 3D printing firearms, obviously the end goal is I can buy an affordable 3D printer, like let's say a ghost gunner. Let's say, you know, like the Ghost Gunner 27, you know, version 27 or something like that. I don't know how long it's going to be. Like Ghost Gunner version 27 where you, you're not Ghost Gunner. That's not a 3D printer. Um, so, like, let's say there's, a, let's say there's, I don't know, just a, a 3D printer and, you know, it costs $2,000. And you can 3D print all the full ARs that you want. They're sturdy. They're stable. Um, you can you can print, you, you can 3D print your own your, your own guns um, for self-defense. Um, I mean, that that's kind of what, what we're working towards, right? Um, so I'm kind of curious. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. I, it's, it's, and, and we can't, we can't, we can't foresee the future, obviously, but um, I don't know. That's, that's, that's the goal. Um, that's obviously the goal. So I'm, I'm just, I, I, yeah. Is there anything else you want, you want to speak to in regards to these, these very high end 3d printers that can do what we need them to do, right? Like we, we need, we need, we need 3d printers that can do that, but we need them to be affordable so that, you know, we can, we can own the means of production. Right. <laughs> right. Um, I, I say <clears throat> my guess is it'll be 10 years with an under of five years and then over of 20 years. So somewhere from five to 30 years, I can see it being something that, I mean, it'll be expensive, but you could afford. 
Sure. Because at the end of the day, you run into a situation where any metal powder that you shoot with a laser in the presence of oxygen will want to explode. So you either have to print in a vacuum or in like a reduced oxygen environment or a plain old inert environment. So you fill it with argon and not krypton. <laughs> okay, so so it's it's very it's very complex shit. It's dangerous. Um, you know, like it's it's right. It's, and, the, and, and 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 it's not just like, um, it's not like. So I was watching. Um, it was I think it was um, like maybe one of Tone Bay's live streams, and there it was. Uh, it was like the he had a bunch of lawyers on there talking about Cody Wilson's case. And so the guy was 3D printing, you know, it's like a small Liberator pistol on his printer. And like, well, well, he was doing, he's like, yeah, here's what I came out with. Like, you know, this is, this is, this is what it is. And um, <clears throat> obviously, like, if you're talking, if we're talking about 3D printing metals, as you've explained, it's dangerous. Um, so like, it, it's, it can't just be like this unit you leave on your desk, you know, record it, record a, you know, live show and just watch it happen. No, like, a, <laughs> a little more complicated than that, huh? All right. You end up wanting an inert environment and. I, I can hypothesize a world where such a thing could, you know, be in your home. So, I mean, because 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 the, the the reason that I, I think that the reason that like polymer three D printing got so cheap is just the technology became so abundant that you know it, it's able to be made for cheap. I don't think that that's going to happen with metal three D printing. So I think you have to wait until the cons you know the average consumer needs a use for metal three D printing before it'll get cheap. Right. I don't think that you'll end up stumbling upon, oh, it's just so cheap to do it now that because that's just more or less how polymer 3D printing went was, you know, somebody realizes, you know, using cheap Chinese microcontrollers, I can make this printer for next to nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. And somebody realizes, you know, you can get decent quality out of that, but you're not going to be able to do that with you know, the, the design constraints of metal 3D printing really aren't going to let you do that. Because you know, just the power supply for a laser is going to end up running you five or six hundred dollars now. The cheapest you can find such a power supply is going to be very expensive. Right, right. For, for that reason, for for that reason, the price isn't going to really come down until there's demand for them. And I don't know what that demand looks like. Like maybe ten years from now, Tesla is the only car that you can buy and. You know, all, all replacement parts are made in your home because Tesla started selling metal 3D printers. I don't know, but you know, that, in that such was, a situation, that was, that was gonna be that was gonna be my question: was what what do you think the demand for this for these metal 3D printers will be? And it, it's hard to see, right? But like with even with right. 3D printers with pol with you know with, with polymers now, uh, with, you know with, with with plastic and polymers. I mean, there really there still, isn't really there a, isn't really a demand for them. Like this isn't something like. Um, Amazon, you know, five, you know, fifty thousand positive reviews. It's not something like that. Like the, the general public doesn't give a damn about three D printing and plastics. They don't. It's just the fact that the, uh, I guess the, um, um, uh, the, it just be, it just became cheap to produce, and they sell them <laughs> to whoever wants them. Um, it's it's you can print like Warcraft figurines, and that's probably the most useful thing they do. Like, uh, right. Print your Warhammer 40,000 figurines, even. And as far as like the public's concerned, like the non gun printing public, that's probably the most useful they are as far as helping you out and making things that you couldn't get otherwise. Like little knickknacks for your desk or little cool models of dragons or castles or stuff or whatever. You can buy most of that stuff retail. But like Warhammer figurines, they're expensive. Sure. So you can 3D print them and then you're, you're, you're out, you come out ahead that way. But otherwise, the consumer has no interest in them because, you know, it's, it's a hobby thing. It's a toy that takes your money and your time and doesn't really, you know, benefit you that much. Yeah, and, and I think, and, 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 and I mean, that's, that's kind, of, kind of what I expected. But, I mean, I, I interviewed Cody, as, as you know, and, and, and you know a lot more about this shit than he does, by the way. And, and he would admit that, too. Um, he, he would he openly, admit, openly admit on that interview. Um, but, I mean, like... I don't know. It, it's it's disappointing in a little in a little bit of a sense, but we're, you know we're dealing with we're, we're dealing with reality. I mean, I would love tomorrow to be able to buy an affordable three D printer and three D printer rifle, but um, you know you, you can you can you know what what's uh, what's the saying you know wish in one hand you know piss in the other or piss you know shit in the other and see which one gets full faster. Yeah, which one um, <laughs> so um, it, it's it's and, you know it's a, it's a little disappointing, but I mean can't foresee the future. I mean there the something could happen where. I don't know. There might be some sort of consumer consumer demand. Um, I, I I I really don't know. Um, but 
anyway, let, let's let's get back to the story here and finish this up before um, before we lose any more listeners. <laughs> Not that, right. I, although I don't think we've lost that many. I mean, the the, the Vonnie podcast we don't have a huge audience, but at the same time, um, you know, there there's going to be a lot of new folks listening um, to this to this interview. So let's yeah. let's get back to the story. Okie dokie. So we had left off. I had, I had said like the, the the next project we wanted to do was something that would be three D printable. Right. Yes, so yes, something yes. that the end user can benefit from. So if you're Joe Schmo and you're like on the verge, like I want to check out this 3D printing gun stuff. It's something that would make you pull the trigger on. I want to get interested. Okay, this shit's mm-hmm. cool. So there had been a guy who had been that I DM'd with on Twitter before. You know, he was showing me like he had 3D printed some Glock frames, but it looked like they were only running in 22. And such a thing had been done before. But, you know, he was telling me that this is all like he had his own like homemade rail system or whatever. Like he was like printing rails for him that were drop-in, and so that, you know, for that reason, they were better than the Glock frames that had been out there, because the ones that were out there had, like, rails that were permanently attached to the frame, and the rails are so thin. With 3D printing stuff in polymer, anything that's thin ends up weaker than it should be because it's 3D printed, where if it's injection molded, it would be stronger because it's 3D printed, and it's so thin, it doesn't have as much strength to it as it should. So... You know, he's telling me about this do-it-yourself rail system, and I'm not, I'm really, really not putting two and two together on it. Until he's, you know, he says, you know, you can make these rails out of aluminum, and I'm going, well, okay, you know, and I'm starting to, you know, my, my gears are starting to get going, and he's like, well, I've made these rails out of aluminum, and I'm running nine millimeter through it, and I go, there it is, you can 3D print your own Glock frame, so long as you have a way to make these, you know, these metal inserts, and so he sent me the machinist drawings for these metal inserts, and I mean, you, you don't, even, you don't need like a, you don't need to understand machining at all. If you know how to read calipers and you know how to use a hacksaw, you can make these rails. They are ridiculously simple shape. Huh. And they don't need to be particularly strong. I've been making them out of cheap bar stock I bought off of Amazon, like bar stock. Al- so to the, you know, the gears in my head finally click and move into motion. It's, well, now you can 3D print a Glock frame. You can use this simple rail insert to you know, hold the slide to the frame. And you know this, you know this opens a big chapter because it's something Foscat has wanted to do for a long, long time: is be able to 3D print Glock frames in something other than 22. 22 is nice, but you know they want something bigger than that, like nine millimeter would be great. So uh, the, the the guy goes by Freeman. Don't ask. I'm sure people have seen him around by now, or at least seen mention of his name there. Um, he had suffered a computer crash where he lost a lot of the CAD that he had done on the do-it-yourself clock frames. So we sort of picked up from like where he had left off on like a, his, you know, trying to rest, 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 recover his work. So there was uh, quite a bit of trial and error because he, he was under the impression it would work like right off the bat, like his first iteration. So I, I bought all the parts I need to build a clock. Uh, put put everything together, machine the front rail block, and it did like four shots, and then it cracked on, we, we were using like plastic rear rails, so Glocks have rails in the front, in front of the locking block, and they have rails in the back around like the trigger housing, and so it cracked on those plastic printed rails at the rear. And so, it's then, then that I sort of realized, you know, so we're got, there is going to be some R&D work in this, it isn't going to be as simple as tests, it works, and then we're ready to post it. So we, we do a little bit of validation. We go back and forth. I think it ended up being a month of very intense work where it was pretty much every day, like in the morning, I'd set the printer to print a frame and then I'd come back after whatever I was doing and I'd assemble the frame and I'd test it. And then I'd get back to uh, Freeman Don't Ask and I'd be like, you know, this needs to change. Like, you know, this is a little bit loose. You know, this, you know, this needs to be modified. So we ended up moving the slide closer to the frame by like half a millimeter and we ended up moving it back another tenth of a millimeter. We ended up making the locking block extra tight, you know, snug in its pocket. We ended up making the rail pocket the correct snugness and the correct depth and changing the spec on the rail block itself. We ended up adding metal rear rails that you screwed in place. We ended up finding like the best place to put those screws. We ended up finding out that pins or like roll pins wouldn't really work for holding the rear rails in place. It had to be screws. But we eventually find our way along to it's possible to do and so long as you're willing to put you know a little bit of dedication into it it's not difficult to do and it's not like you now i made my first rail block on a milling machine just to save myself time because on a mill it's much quicker but you don't need that you could do it on a drill press if you wanted to take the time you could do it with a hacksaw if you wanted to take the time 
In fact, I have made a rail block using just like a hacksaw and metal files. I mean, as well as I show that you can use a circular saw for one step, but you could just use a hacksaw or file. It just depends on how much time you're willing to put into this. So, you know, it's possible to make these rail blocks other ways, as well as like if you're involved in or understand what like a lost, lost PLA casting is, you print your part in plastic and then make an investment mold out of it, melt the plastic out, and then you pour aluminum into that mold and then you cast your aluminum part where that plastic negative used to be. Uh, you can do your rail blocks that way quite easily. So, you know, you've got options. You, you make the rail blocks. I leave the creativity up to you. I'll try and point you in the right direction, what I think works well. But beyond that, you know, it's up to you. But then the frame will be fully printable. You can print it in PLA, which is like the easiest polymer to print in. It's, you know, everyone learns to print in PLA because it prints so nice and it doesn't warp and it doesn't smell bad. So, so, so beautiful, so nice and easy to use. And it comes in pretty much any color you can name. Oh, so, so it's, the it's customizable then. You can get your favorite color. Right. Oh, wow. So that's what that Glock project sort of became. And it was while I was doing that that I realized everyone who's out there, and, and maybe this is part of Glock culture, like everyone who has a Glock modifies it. They want to change it. And they got to make it different, got to stand out, got to have like the custom cutouts on your slide. You know, Make a Gucci Glock as they're referred to, right? And you have to make it your own. So it's not enough to own a Glock. You have to you have to make it stand out just a little bit. You know, <laughs> some, some people just want small modifications. Some people want it to be so there's zero Glock parts left on the gun. Whatever. So you know, float, float your boat. So we then, as we were doing this project, you know, a couple people in FOSCAD were like really into it because, like I had mentioned, like FOSCAD wanted this to happen ages ago, but you know, had lost steam on the project. So here we were with like, you know proof of concepts. Like I was posting for a while, like a video a day of. You know, I'd go and take the clock out to the backyard range and just pow, 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 pop away. And we, we ran into a couple issues. There was issues that we ironed out by adjusting the slide to frame fitment and uh, adjusting the tolerance on the rail block. And we ended up ironing those out, except I, I had this persistent failure to extract issue where it would just not extract the fired round from the chamber, mm -hmm. which ended up being... Uh, the fault of like the, the metal parts, like the factory parts of the gun that I bought off the shelf didn't work. I mean, wow. like the traditional metal gun didn't work. No way. The 3D printed parts of it did better, which was kind really? of funny. But uh, it ended up being a, a Dremel tool polishing job, ended up fixing it. And now, now it just runs flawlessly. I haven't had a failure to extract in ages and ages with it now. But uh, so, so that aside, we, we then decided, you know, the project is ready to go. Once I was very certain that it was the, that it was my factory parts that didn't want to work right, that they were the cause for the only issue that was remaining. So we put together our teaser video. Well, I say we. I shot footage for it, which is the easy part, and then Jacob did his amazing editing on it. And I'm I'm sure you've seen it by now, but God, it, I, you know, I go back and watch it sometimes, and it still gives me chills. It's just so good. And, uh, and and it would be in the video it, if we didn't have if 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 we didn't have so many issues with um <laughs> with audio and actually no I I'll still put out I'll still put out that first part in the video but once we have that first uh, once we have uh, like maybe the second interruption I might uh, cut cut I guess just general video from there but anyway I'll I'll, I'll make sure that's in there man. <laughs> okay, dokie. Oh man, it's good. I like that so much, but. And after that trailer, I mean, it, it garnered massive attention. I think the month that it went out, I gained like 1,300 followers in a month. It was insane. Because I guess, you know, everyone cares about Glocks. Like the AR reference model, I understand people not caring about it. I didn't know people would care this much about being able to print your own Glock. But, you know, there it was. So we went on, me and Jacob went on the Commando Blog podcast. And, we, you know, we, we, we shot the shit with them, talked about mm -hmm. stupid stuff. And I, I guess... I guess all of those like four chainy types are all weebs, like 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 the nasty, disgusting. You're gonna catch viruses from them weebs. But you know they're, they're talking about how they're gonna mutilate my our, our hard our hard project. Me and Freeman don't ask are both not weebs, and so they were telling us, you know, they're telling me that they were gonna like put like trap waifus and shit on the grips, and I was like, great, I, I put all this work in so you can have your trap waifu clock. That's actually exactly why I do this, but. <laughs> It's kind of silly, but so so you know that happened, and then there was a guy who did like a Lightning McQueen inspired one, which was kind of disturbing. But 
I, I mean, it was artistic. I can appreciate it. Like it's like your kachow Glock, I guess. I don't know. So it was well received, and it was I think a week after the Glock project went live, which was on three seventeen, that Menendez put you know his infamous letter to New Jersey. Uh, not to, new, new, wow, Menendez from New Jersey writes his letter to Twitter saying. Ivan the Troll is spreading potentially nefarious information. <laughs> potentially nefarious. <laughs> <laughs> but his incendi- his declaration was, it, my, my first assumption was like you know th- that he was going to mention the Glock files in there somewhere, right? Because uh, I'm no dummy. I realize that handguns are used in crime far more than they are within, you know, rifles are. Right. Handguns are like the weapon of murdering people. That makes sense to me. I understand why that would be the case. And I don't understand why someone would be upset about the fact that now you now, now you have another option to make to making a Glock that doesn't exist in the eyes of the government. But no, it turns out that the only thing he was upset about was the fact that you can 3D print your own AR-15 using the files I put out. Now, if you remember, I made a big point out of you can't print it, 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 you can't print it. Right. I put that in the tweet that he specifically mentioned, you know, he specifically mentioned Ivan the Troll has announced that you can 3D print an AR-15. The tweet that he was referencing, that he had taken that quote from, there was the first reply to that tweet was me saying, now, this doesn't mean that you can 3D print an AR-15. Jesus Christ. Does, does Bobby, was, was Bobby too busy nailing his underage hookers to notice that I specifically <laughs> said, <laughs> I specifically said, this does not mean that you can print an AR-15. <laughs> no, but Bo- Bobby doesn't care about that. Bobby didn't read the read me where it says this doesn't mean you can 3D print an AR-15. That J- just as the just as the, just as the rest of the the politicians in the media don't understand that you can't use Liberator pistols for mass shootings. Cody, right. you know, Cody said himself, I probably have the best firing record of of, of the Liberator pistol of all time. It's like 50-50. Like I don't know if it's going to fire or not. <laughs> and they're like, these are going to be taken on planes. People are going, they're going to, you oh, know, man. terrorists are going to take over planes. They're going to take them into schools. They're going to be mass shootings all the time. The terror, the stereo, it's going to be so bad. Oh, God, no, dude. It's just, it's complete, it's complete scare tactics. And so I thought it was a joke. And so, you know, I made a joke of it. And I was almost kind of proud of it, right? So now, look, I've got clout. I've got people coming after me because I'm exercising my rights, right? That's like the ultimate clout. In, in the circles you run in, right? Because everyone's like, oh, did you see what happened to Ivan? He's got a senator who's painted a target on him for <laughs> exercising his rights. Darn me, I should just, you know, f- fall in line and board the train, I guess. But You didn't it, do that, so, though. No, I did not. Uh, so I, I made fun of Menendez. It my, my, was my option. And so I carried on. I'd had a couple conversations from like the more sensible side of Foscad because there's like a radical side of Foscad and a sensible side of Foscad. The sensible side is just, you know, this is a hobby and we enjoy doing it. And I think I probably identify stronger with them deep down. But like the part of me that likes antagonizing people and making people mad at me identifies very strongly with the whole like radical, <laughs> we're going to print a gun and we're not going to apologize for it side of things. So... Yeah, so so the, the 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 sensible side of Fosk had advised me like, if you're going to do this, you need to be more polite. So like, quit bickering with people because like, like like my thing on Twitter is I call people ignorant whenever they don't know what they're talking about. So I feel like calling people stupid is maybe somewhat offensive, but calling someone ignorant when they literally don't know what they're talking about isn't offensive. But I decided fine, I'll you know I'll stop calling people ignorant because that that was like the worst I was doing at that point was you know I'd call you ignorant when you were being ignorant. So I quit doing that. You know, everything was merry, merry. Hadn't heard from Twitter in a long time. And so two months after Menendez's letter was written, my Twitter account suspended. Like I was on it one minute. And then five minutes later, I checked my phone. It says I'm suspended. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so I figured like, you know, somebody must have reported something. And then some Twitter employee was like, yep, we're going to suspend the account. So I appealed. Twitter promises they'll get back to you in seven days on appeal. On the eighth day, they finally got back to me. And they said that your, you know, your account was banned for repeat or multiple violations of our terms of service. Usually they give you an actual reason whenever they ban your account. And especially whenever you appeal it and ask for the reason your account right. was banned, they'll give it to you usually. So they just told me repeat or multiple violations of our terms of service. Based on my Google Foo, the reason they do that is because they suspect your account of being a bot account. Clearly my account wasn't a bot account. I was releasing never-before-seen uh, content to the Internet. 
there's no way you could even even using like the like the trollbot.com like is this account a troll bot i scored like a 50 percent so i was only like a 50 percent bot so you can't ban me for being a bot like trump is like trump was a higher percentage of being a bot than i was so you can't ban me for being a bot so um from there it was like uh you know, so so what do i do i wasn't going to get back on twitter but i decided fine i'll get back on twitter you know i'll play this song and dance again and so in what was maybe sort of a mistake, I ended up talking to a journalist from The Trace because this journalist had told me that he had had contact from both Twitter and Menendez giving their sides, you know, like their reactions to my ban. And so he said he was running a story on the whole thing. Huh. And so, so I figured like the worst that happens is I tell him the truth, you know, tell him my side of the story. He's going to spin it. I'm sure of it. It's going to be like, you know, it's going to be guns bad, orange man bad long with Hillary is going to be how the story goes, which is fine. You know, that's what I expect to happen. But at the very least, you know, I wanted to see what's going on. Like, like you actually got Twitter to admit to banning my account. This was incredible. So, so I went ahead and talked to him. He seemed like an all right guy. The article was very slanted. The article ended up getting my YouTube account banned. That being said, I was violating YouTube's terms of service. You know, YouTube's terms of service specifically say you can't tell people how to make guns. That's exactly what I was doing on YouTube. So whatever, that makes sense. You're right. It probably is going to put my current Twitter account in the crosshairs. I realize that, but you, you know, th th this journalist was going to run this report about my account anyway. If I talk to him, I don't think that'll end up hurting anything. But it turns out in that article from The Trace, Twitter told Menendez my account was banned because I was an alt account. Because apparently Ivan the Troll 12 was an alt account and I'd previously been suspended. Which is bizarre because that's the first Twitter account I ever signed up for. The first Twitter account I ever used that email for. The first Twitter account I ever used that phone number for. So mm -hmm. not only is it like actually literally my first Twitter, there's no way they'd be able to prove that it is a like a, a multi like a alt account of anyone because i never used that identifying information with any other account ever before so unless twitter's like stealing location data and using it that way and even still i never had a twitter account tied to my person ever before that so prove it's an alt account really that's bullshit and mm -hmm. i'm sure they knew that's bullshit because whenever this uh, uh journalist from the trace contacted them and asked them for the reason i was banned Twitter told them I was banned because I was engaging in illegal conduct. Because sharing files for 3D printed firearms is illegal in New Jersey, I was breaking the law. Because what's illegal in New Jersey, now I guess apparently New Jersey is like the arbitrator of what is legal. So things that are federally legal, such as sharing links to public domain information, if it's illegal in New Jersey, it's illegal for anyone on Twitter to engage in it. Smoking yep. pot's illegal in New Jersey, right? So, so everyone, including the people in Colorado who post videos of themselves smoking pot, I expect Twitter to get on this. Man, these guys are breaking the law. Yeah. It, it's, just, it's just stupid. And, it, and it's an example of the, these companies who are the public forum are above the law or are above, are, are above acting on their own terms of service. So according to Twitter terms of service, 3D printing gun plans should not be illegal. All I'm doing is linking to information that is public domain information. It's no more harmful in the eyes of the law than linking to a public book at a li public library telling you how to make a gun. And such yeah. things exist. There are books on home gunsmithing that exist in public libraries. Such a book would be illegal in New Jersey, of course, but is New Jersey really the arbitrator of what is and isn't legal on the internet? And, and, did, and, did, they, and did, they, did they go and remove those books from the library too? I, if, if, if anyone knows you want New Jersey, have them go to li you know, public libraries around New Jersey and see if they can find any home gunsmithing books. I think it'd be interesting little, you know, uh, field I'd experiments. See if they're breaking their own laws. Right. Not that it matters, but it'd just be, it'd just be, um, it, it'd be cool to publicize that, I think. Right. But yeah, so that was, that was like the drama of my Twitter ban, which is probably ongoing because I expect this one's like living on limited time. But uh, really, I, th I think that ended up benefiting us as a whole. Because after that ban came down, I think right before the article, someone was banned. I think it was in Carbonite was banned. And then Yoshitomo Imura was also banned. And so this is like a hold up. You know, Twitter's banning these people who have been sharing files. So their terms of service doesn't say you can't share files, but you're not allowed to share files. And so uh, whenever in, in Carbonite appealed his ban, 
uh, you know, he was specifically given, and the reason for his appeal was denied. But they didn't get they get they didn't give me an actual reason. But they told him his was due to illegal conduct. So they've now drawn the uh. line that illegal conduct sharing files is now illegal conduct, even though their terms of service doesn't explicitly say so. Sharing files that are public domain information is no now now no longer allowed on Twitter if they say it isn't allowed. So you know, New Jersey has become the arbitrator of what isn't isn't legal on the internet, which is great. Regardless of if you live in New Jersey or not, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter if you live in a state adjacent to New Jersey. I live halfway across the country from New Jersey, and evidently I'm subject to their authoritarian rule, which is nice. But wow, after yeah. after you know, yeah. our circles have seen what's happening there, we moved to Keybase. We've got like a hundred member strong community on Keybase, so sort of like the core. The core guys who are interested in the development and the proliferation, as well as a couple guys who are like the crypto freaks who really understand that angle, because I'm like a self-admitted -admit crypto idiot. I really don't know that much about it. <laughs> I know Bitcoin's cool. I know I enjoy having some, but uh, you know, beyond that, that's just not my area of expertise. I couldn't tell you why shit coins are bad, other than they're shit coins and it's in their name. So, <laughs> to get an idea give you an idea of my crypto illiteracy it's bad because it's not bitcoin and that's that's what i understand <laughs> but, fair enough but, you know we, we got those guys to help us understand that side of things so you know we, we've got ourselves a good base of people who are knowledgeable about the things that we need to continue to thrive and survive so what twitter coming after us has done is made us smarter we now realize that the lines twitter is taking is sharing public domain information so as long as you don't share links to public domain information you'll be okay so we've avoid we have now avoided doing that on Twitter, and in, it's the same case on Reddit, right? So Reddit won't allow links to public domain information. So we've avoided links to public domain information on Reddit as well. So you know life goes on that way. It's it sucks, but that's the way it goes. Um, we we have our core group of people. We can share files with each other on Keybase because it's all end to end encrypted. So we're fine there. Mm-hmm. And releases are still, you know, all full steam ahead, as scheduled as ever. Like we had that tech, printable Tech Nine frame release, which is another Freeman Don't Ask uh, project, uh, and rather interesting one. I wish there were more Tech Nine kits out there, but that's neither here nor there. I mean, you can find <laughs> them. I just don't want to pay three hundred bucks for a Tech Nine. Right. I'd rather have another Glock, bucks. But so, uh, so I guess there's there's. Project. So, so I guess there, there's two things, and I think you put this in, in one of your uh, one of your tweets that you know this 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 happened, and you know the, the, obviously the idea, you know, Senator, uh, you know, Senator Shithead was trying to um, trying to stop this, right? You know, like you know, stop the proliferation of these files, and. What actually happened, um, according to uh, I think according to your tweet, was that you're more organized now. Uh, you know, uh, th things are, things are working better. You've got alternative platforms, and uh, yeah, full full steam ahead, better than we ever were before. Um, so so that's uh, <laughs> so so that's that's obviously a good thing. And then the other thing as well. I'd be curious. There's a book, um, and I know this because uh, I run something called Liber Libertarian Type Publications, and it's uh, supposed to be the um, supposed to be the replacement for a, a radical publishing outfit called Lumpanics Unlimited that went defunct in 2006. They published some very radical shit. Um, uh, Erwin Strauss uh, he wrote he wrote a couple books. Um, one of them was not as inflammatory, but the other one was like how to make nukes in your basement or something like that. Um, and I'd be curious. I don't know if that's digital. Well, it is digitally available because I went and found it and downloaded it. Um, I would be curious. That's public. You know, that's uh, is, that was a question I was brought up to Cody. Like, well, when are you, when are you gonna you know come up with the, 3D, the plans to three D print print for three D print nukes? And he was like, well, they're already out there. Um, so I'd be curious as as a sort of test. Um, I'd be willing to. Um, I have the I have the PDF file of it. Um, I'd have to uh, I'd have to find a way. I'm not. I, I used to spend a lot of time transcribing books or I guess uh, um, or I guess digitizing books so I'd type the entire book into a word document and then it'd be digitized I'm not, I'm not doing that anymore um, not unless it's something really important a really important volume publication um, but if there's a way to get that PDF into like uh, well I guess it doesn't matter if it's a PDF is fine um, start sharing that shit around on Twitter like how to, how to make a nuke in your basement like it's public information has been for a long time and see what they do about that you know um, I don't know what do you think <laughs> I mean, I, I like the gusto. The, the problem with it becomes Twitter is the arbitrator of their platform. And as much as I don't want to sound like greedy big government, I think that eventually becomes a problem when like the president's on Twitter and the president announced things on Twitter before he announces them to the press or the public in general. Like 
Twitter has become the public forum. Like you're either on Twitter or you're uh, out. Yeah. To some certain extent. I mean, we're not we're not quite there yet, but it's close. I mean, we're at the point where a presidential debate could take place entirely on Twitter, and that wouldn't be outside of the norm. In fact, I think that that you know limiting them to however many characters would probably make for a more interesting presidential debate anyway. As well as you'd get more young people interested in it if they didn't have to like turn on the TV if they could just read it. Or but, if it was just live stream on Twitter, right? <laughs> Which happens. But I feel like I feel like there's your you know, there's your evidence that Twitter has sort of become the public forum. So whenever Twitter decides that you know something that is perfectly legal where I live, sharing public domain information. Whenever they decide that I can be kicked off their platform because that's illegal in New Jersey, and it doesn't matter that I'm not in New Jersey, it's just that in New Jersey that's illegal, and so that's my problem. You know, they've crossed the line from they're a content provider to they're a content moderator, and if they're a content moderator, I believe they should be legally responsible for every last bit of content on their website. That includes things that are like, uh, like you know, beyond offensive, so things that are like illegal. So you know, pick, picture something, an illegal picture in your head, whatever it is that that picture that you're thinking of. I'm sure it has been posted to Twitter and then quickly taken down by their moderators. But if even one person saw it or saved it, Twitter should be legally responsible for that if Twitter is now taking it upon themselves to moderate all the content that's on their website, since apparently public domain information needs to be moderated. Interesting point. Interesting point. Because I... I know, I know in, in legal proceedings, Google has used the defense that they're not a content moderator, they're a content provider because someone was suing someone and Google was wrapped in up in it and it was about, it had something to do with child porn. So Google was trying to use the defense that we're not responsible for what's on our website. We're just there to provide the links to you. So we don't, we, you know, we don't provide you with child porn, we just to provide you with the links that other people use to provide you with child porn. So Google got off on saying we're not a provider, we're just here, we're a content provider, but not a content moderator. But Twitter has taken the step, like Twitter at this point is a content moderator. They even came on Joe Rogan's show and said, there are certain, you know, certain people and themes and things that we protect that are protected topics. So like gender identity is the one example they gave. Like right. your gender identity, if you're being attacked over it, something that is not okay on Twitter, that cannot stand. Now, your interest in firearms or your interest... And maybe I just need to make my gender identity firearms or something and try and argue that one in. I don't know. Like I'm an attack helicopter now and anybody who stops me from speaking about guns is assaulting my gender and that's racist or whatever. And I need to read about that. But yeah, it, so it really just doesn't make it it's doesn't, a, it's a slippery. It's, it's a slippery Twitter slope. Has, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Twitter on... has crossed this line. They're a moderator, and if they are a moderator, I think they should be legally responsible for everything that goes on on their site. Or they can back up and say freedom of speech is the rule of our sites because we're an American company, and that's what we're going to adhere to. Right, right, and and I remember, and, and you know, this this is the uh, for, for those that that uh, that aren't aware, um, today is the I guess the is the four year anniversary of Ross Ulbricht's sentencing, and uh, for for those that aren't familiar, Ross Ulbricht basically uh, basically set up a website, and um, you know they mod you know they moder you know they moderated it if it if it could hurt somebody, um, then it wasn't allowed on there. So they were it sounds like uh, you know kind of what you're saying here. They went from you know content provider content moderation. Not that not that they make a difference for the context of that site, um, but <clears throat> oh man, I don't know, I don't know. It's uh. It's hard. I mean, uh, if, if if someone get locked up for just for just putting up a website, um, that's 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 dangerous. And then Twitter, which, um, you know, uh, as you were kind of saying, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I hadn't heard that argument before. I really hadn't. So all I've ever heard from the uh, the ANCAPs on on fascist book is basically that you know the private company can do what they want to, um, and 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 I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know if uh, if you get a bunch of fucking a uh, bunch of tax, tax you know taxpayer dollars, can you really be considered privately funded? And, and I, I think your arguments uh, your arguments uh, arguments uh, sound. I I really do. Um, it's just yeah, not not one I've not one I've heard before. Um, certainly not one I've heard before. So um, I guess is is there anything else uh, regarding? I mean we we we've, we've been on here for a while, man. Um, yeah, we, yeah, we've been on here for a while, and uh, we haven't even gotten any listener questions. Um, so, is there anything else regarding your case that you wanted to get to, um, or, or sh should we should we save the listener questions for another episode? Or uh, I mean, I mean, what, what, what do you think? That gets to our case. Let's do the listener. Let's do the listener questions, 
But then let's also do, as a follow-up, let's just do like as an as in-depth technical one as we can do. So I'll go over like the different kinds of printers and what that does and what that means and what's the limits of the tech and stuff. Like we could do an episode that's just that, which would be like we could keep it to an hour and it could be like good reference material. Perfect, perfect. Um, yes, that... People who are like, I want to get into this, give me something to listen to. Perfect, we could, yep. We can try and do that. Yep, gun, gun printing 101. Um, we can do an episode on that for sure, yeah. for sure. All right, so Ivan, let's get to some listener questions here. Now that we're a couple hours into this uh, into this interview with uh, the the half or I guess the half dozen interruptions so far, I did internet or whatever. So um, anyway, I, I guess the the first question I'll ask is uh, is are, are you? I, I don't know how much all of this costs. You said I think the magazines cost like two dollars each to print or something like that. Um, I mean, how how much uh, is is this all out of pocket for you guys? So as of now, it is pretty much entirely funded by like you know you do your nine to five and then. You sink your money into your projects as you see fit. Okay, so it is so it is uh, um, largely self-funded. I mean, is there is there a Bitcoin address or something that someone can donate to? There is, and the the easy way to do that is through we we set up a Bitbacker some time back for and for the uninitiated, it's essentially just Patreon, but it accepts crypto only, because there is some concern about like m- myself and the other the others who collect under the name Deterrence Dispensed. You know, there is some need for our own anonymity. Sure. So we're working. We've got a couple guys working on a good way to move our crypto to fiat because you know, most places that sell 3D printer filament or bullets won't accept uh, crypto for one reason or the other, mm-hmm. be it their FUDs or be it their, uh, you know, just, just haven't adopted it yet. So uh, you know, crypto is good, of course, because it lets us take the money anonymously and we, we're working on our way to move it to fiat without making it you know, extremely trackable. Right, at, so... At least in a way that, you know, we get docs, though. So, so we're, we're not concerned about the government. You know, I'm sure the government knows who, exactly who I am, and that doesn't bother me because everything I do is perfectly legal all the time, always. But as far as, like, you know, the concern groups, like Brady and stuff, I'm sure they'd love to know my identity so they could dox me and make my life miserable. Sure. But I'd like to make it as difficult as possible for them. Although, you know, I'm, of course, not opposed to having people help you know, fund my efforts. So that's why we got the Bitbacker set up. So mm-hmm. you know, to reiterate, it's like like Patreon, but for crypto only. So you can find us on Bitbacker. If you just like Google Bitbacker deterrence dispense, you'll find us. And of course, you know, any money you kick our way is of course appreciated. And uh, if you attach a message whenever you give like a super chat in that, so it's like you, you, you pledge a super chat or whatever, and you can attach a message to it. You can go ahead and say like whatever it is. Like, like if you've got something that you prefer, we spend that money on. We'll do our best to spend that money that way. We haven't actually spent any of the money we've taken in donations yet, simply because we don't have a great way to move it to fiat. Mm-hmm. Like I could, I could set up a Coinbase and connect that Coinbase to my actual real life bank account. Yeah, don't do that. But I feel like that's not a great option. Yeah, don't use Coinbase. No, as I, as I would. As soon as, <laughs> yeah. as soon as Coinbase knows that that's happening, they're not going to like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's there there was a big uh, crypto. I mean, you mentioned Twitter, and, and this is a, a another another good thing here is that I, I found uh, uh, you know I I used to I had I've had a Twitter account for a long time, but never really used it. But it, I guess until like the past year or so, and Twitter is so much better than Facebook. Um, I mean, it's still a you know it's still a shit show. It's still bad, but as far as the people, as far as the people on Twitter. Um, I mean, I, I don't like I, I know less people on Twitter than I do on on on, on fascist book, but. I don't know. I, I think the, the the community there's uh, maybe maybe just a, a little better. Um, all right, so the, the, the we'll get into some, some some interesting questions here, um, or I guess uh, some some more interesting questions for the listeners. Uh, so when will the first three D printed electromagnetic railgun be released? Is that is that like the, the next step in your guys's roadmap? Yeah, so probably not. I feel like this question is mostly a joke. It is. However, there is a company. There is a company that will sell, or that does sell, like Gauss rifles. So, for people unfamiliar, like a railgun uses. A, I'm too tired to think about the scientist dickhead's name, but some scientist does law or whatever, like the right hand rule. So, if you like with magnetism, you, know, you get current moving one way and you have force moving the other way. So you run a lot of current through some rails, and it generates a lot of force, like a magnetic force in the middle of the two rails. And so because of that, and you can uh, increase this effect 
by having the the projectile between the two rails touching the two rails so it completes the circuit between the two rails. So that creates a significant force on the projectile that throws the projectile out of the barrel. The problem is the projectile is touching the, bar the rails the entire time it does this, and so if you move that projectile fast enough, it wears out the rails pretty quick. Uh, also, rail guns are incredibly energy consumptious. They, they eat lots and lots of energy, and they generate a lot of heat, of course. Mm -hmm. So my solution to that problem, just like this company's solution was, was to make a Gauss rifle, which is like the same super cool electronic propulsion system, except it uses like a, a switching series of magnets. So it uses a magnet to pull your projectile forward, then it switches the polarity and then pushes it towards another magnet that pulls it, then pushes it and pulls it and pushes it all the way out the barrel. So this company sells them, and I think that it shoots like like uh, ball bearings like 180 feet per second. So it would be enough. It'd bruise you. It'd hurt really bad. Although it wouldn't, it wouldn't. You couldn't really kill anybody with it yet. But it shoots full auto like 500 rounds a minute. And because it, you know, because the legal the legal definition of firearms is that it has to use a chemical propellant. This is using electricity. So it's perfectly legal to have one be full auto. It's just like an airsoft gun. It's using an electronic propellant. So, so how much does so, this cost? And it sounds like they'd be good for like home defense. Like if you're shooting, fight, you know, if, really, if you're launching rounds at somebody, really even if it doesn't kill them, it would hurt them pretty badly. <laughs> really expensive though. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I don't like I, I, I I've, I, you know, I've, I've hunted and all that my entire life, but I, I just, I, I haven't really been super into guns. Like I like shooting and all that, but as far as all the, all the details and so, like I've, I haven't heard of that and like some of these other questions, like with, Co like with, uh, with, with interviewing Cody, uh, people would ask questions. I don't know what they mean, but maybe I don't know what they mean, but maybe he does. <laughs> Hopefully he does. Hopefully you do. <laughs> thousand bucks. So that's not bad. A thousand bucks. So that the four point six gram steel balls at forty five meters per second. Which in freedom units is forty five meters per second, two feet per second. So yeah, one hundred and fifty feet per second, like I was saying. So okay. it did hurt, but it would it you know it wouldn't be something you could kill anyone with. But it would it would definitely not be comfortable to be shot with. Sure, sure, yeah, understood. But, understood. So the proof of concept is there. They're selling these as toys. I'm sure if you made like a you know if you put like because because this is running off of a battery that sits inside of a gun like an RC car battery. You could make a battery pack, like a backpack thing you throw on, and I'm sure that you could you could 3D print a rig. Of course, the metal parts would have to be the conductive parts have to be metal. The magnets can't be 3D printed because 3D printing magnets would be insane. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure you could make a setup then that you could. Uh, I mean, you could make it work. I'm sure and hook it up to a battery pack, and you could be slinging these, you know, a thousand feet per second. And all, all you have to do is move something that's a hundred grains. It, a thousand feet per second you'll kill someone with it really easily sure so follow-up question to that one how many times do you think that question's been asked on a podcast or on television or something like that wait never once twice a lot, a lot? i mean i feel like i feel like in the nerdy the nerdy circles right it's are you gonna 3d print a rail gun because rail guns are cool and it's like it, it sort of has these tie-ins to halo and warhammer and right like the geeky side of things it's gonna make a rail gun <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. <clears throat> so, uh, I, I suppose the... the main... Go ahead. No, no one cares about it in the main series. What do they care? It's, it's like science-y guns? No. We have to stick with the ancient tech. So may, you know, maybe one day you see rail guns become a better do-it-yourself solution. Or, not rail guns. I don't think you'll ever see rail guns become a man-portable solution to this question. Gauss guns, they're called Gauss rifles, but I, I shy away from calling it a rifle because it's not a rifle, it's a gun. Because sure. it's not rifled, but whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, these, Gauss, these Gauss projectile shooting devices, which legally are not firearms, it would be interesting to see, right? You could have something full auto, shoot ridiculously fast, and you know, be completely legal to have full auto, shoot ridiculously fast, and be lethal. Right. It would be interesting to see how quick it's moved to ban anything that uses electronic propulsion. <laughs> Uh, you know what happened. You know what happened. <laughs> so uh, the, the the next question here, um, which uh, is it's from uh, from Camp on Twitter, uh, and I had to look this up. So I'm gonna ask a question. I'm gonna give a. I just well, help. Maybe you maybe you can explain it. And I, I won't have to. I won't have to do it myself. But I'll ask a question. You can you can you can you can uh, either explain or I can provide a, a sense def, a sentence explanation. But he said, considering the difficulty with producing a rifled barrel, have you looked into alternative technologies such as fin uh, stabilized Savoy rounds? I think that's. They're called? Sabo is what he's going for. 
Save away. Okay, so um, you know what he's talking about then? Okay, good. So, so to give to give like the briefest possible explanation of this, what he's trying to get is like tank cannons nowadays are not rifled. It's just like a straight pipe. And instead of putting rifling inside the barrel, because it's really hard to cut rifling grooves in a tank barrel because it's big and large diameter and you need deep grooves and you need lots of grooves and the grooves have to be in a long, great big long barrel. The solution, easier solution is you put rifling on your ammo or you don't have your, because you know, rifling uses a spinning bullet to keep it stabilized. The, you know, the, 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 so you can spin to stabilize or you can use fins to stabilize because you don't see a rocket spin like a rifled bullet. Rifle bullets spin over and over again as they're flying. Mm-hmm. Rockets don't spin at all, but they're quite stable as they fly through the air, and that's because they have fins on the end to keep them from tumbling. So, again, I'm going to show my ignorance because I can't bother to think about this and get it right, but you want to look at your center of mass and your center of drag, and I'm pretty sure you want your center of drag behind your center of mass for whatever your projectile is if you want to use fin stabilization because that means that it won't try and tumble because the part that's trying to slow the rocket down is at the back of the rocket. And so because of that, that part will always be, you know, behind uh, just because of how friction works, you know, friction with the air. The part that's trying to slow the rocket down is at the rear of the rocket. And so for that reason, as it's propelled forwards, that part will stay at the rear because it's the part that's generating the most drag. Interesting. Interesting. So Whereas, have you, have you, have you, have you, have you, have you, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. If it's the other way around, the rocket will want to like tumble the whole time it's flying and like not be a rocket and instead turn into like one of those, uh, like, like like the failed bottle rocket compilations, like it just goes and you know, flies all over and then smacks right back into the ground. Right, right. <clears throat> so 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 I guess have you ever considered? Uh, uh, I mean, I, so there was someone that responded on Twitter that said, "Well, Ivan's already figured out a way to you know 3D print you know a rifled barrel, something like that." Um, is that the case? Like, have you have you figured out that problem? Um, and uh, if so, can you explain it? And if not, then have you considered um, this sort of approach to, to possibly uh, 3D printing? Right. So to touch back on to, to fully answer the fin stabilization question, could you 3D print fin stabilization? I guess you could. There's no like technical limitation that would stop you from doing it. The problem becomes you have to radically redesign projectiles, and doing that is incredibly difficult. Not, not even something I'd be willing and engaging in, simply because, as that other guy has sort of led us towards, uh, using, uh, so my, my inspiration for this was a guy named Jeff Rod from Flosscad. He's brighter than I am in many ways. Um, he, he was using electrochemical machining, which for the uninitiated, like the quick way to explain it, if you're familiar with electroplating, it's reverse electroplating. If you're not familiar with electroplating, it's like hyper-rusting. So you're encouraging rust. It's not, it's not like rust, like you think about rust and it's bad. It's like hyper-erosion of any conductive metal using, uh, using a process known as electrolysis. And if that doesn't make sense to you, just think about it as you're removing metal using electric current. So electric current makes the metal flow away. So wherever you're exposed to more electric current, more material is removed. So the way this works then is you can take a steel barrel so like full hard chrome steel. So something that normally it would be very, very hard to cut rifling grooves in. The way the industry would cut rifling grooves in it would be heat the barrel up till it loses its heat treat and then shove a button through it. That, you know, that button adds rifling grooves to it. And that means you need a rifle furnace. And a rifle furnace is like $5,000. So you're already looking at way too much material, to, you know, way too much investment to make it worth it. I used a $100 setup. That $100 setup consisted of tools that I 3D printed and then like readily available like a steel part or steel and copper. And so you use these steel and copper tools together to erode the barrel in a certain manner that you can take an off the shelf hardened steel barrel. You can use these like this electrochemical machining to erode the barrel out till it's the right inside diameter. Then you can erode rifling grooves into it and then you can erode a chamber into it. And I've test fired like 30 rounds through a barrel I've made that way. It's like the most proud I've ever been of myself. It's ridiculously cool, and the best part is, it's so easy, and it's going to sound like, you know, oh, well, you've done it. Of course you'd say that. It is actually so easy a caveman can do it. If on my first attempt, using a car battery as a power supply, I created a workable barrel, anyone can do this using a desktop power supply that provides, like, a constant current, and it's, like, the nice measurable. Like, the second barrel I made, I used a desktop power supply much better way to do it like the, the, it's that's the way to do it plus that desktop power supply was cheaper than a car battery so 
you know, that's the way to do it because it's cheaper. But it's, it's an incredibly easy way that you can make yourself 9 millimeter Luger, so a, a good bullet, rifled barrels, and it costs less than $100 to do it. And so for that reason, I, you know, I, I close any discussion on what about Sabo rounds and that sort of stuff. I, I just close that entire book for another day because what does it matter? This is, this is a thousand times easier than the research and development that would have to go into like thin stabilizing projectiles from small arms. Sure, sure. So, so I guess let me, let me just make an, an observation here <clears throat> and say that, I mean, I don't know any of these FOSCAD guys, but I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit here, man. Um, I mean, you've talked about, like, they've been wanting to do these things for a long time, and you just came in and did it. It's like, oh, these people are way smarter than me in, 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 you know, in, in a lot of ways. Give yourself some credit, man. Like, Jesus Christ. Um, like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, a lot of the stuff is going over my head. Um, but I, I'm, I'm getting what you, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying, but, um, I, I mean, give yourself some credit, man. Seriously. Part of it's just like, I have the different approach. Like if I come at a problem with like a fresh mind, I'm able to make different assumptions than they had made. And that, that just gives me like the, the upper hand even. Sure. So, I mean, I, I do give myself credit. I do realize what I'm doing is significant. And I do realize what I'm doing is like, you know, some of it's like never done before, never documented this well or. You know, and that it's very valuable stuff. But I also recognize it's like I'm, I'm not the only person doing this. And I feel that, you know, at some points it's like like pe people saying like Ivan's the new Cody Wilson. I, I don't agree with that. And, I, and I, don't, I don't know if I even like the way that that sounds. Not to, not not as a dig on Cody, but I, I don't know if I'm comfortable with the way that sounds. Like there's people I – mean, I've been doing this for like, what, a year and a couple months? There's people who have been doing this since before Cody – before anyone knew Cody Wilson's name. There were people doing this. You know, I've talked to Hav Blue, the guy who 3D printed the first AR-15 receiver like 11, 12 years ago. And he was like, no, nah, man, I'm, you know, I'm just a guy and I was just doing this. And you know, in my mind, he started this whole ball rolling. So I think I can understand like the people see me and they kind of like idolize or maybe like fetishize what it is that I'm doing. The same way that I look at Hav Blue and I go, wow, it's amazing what you did when, you know, from his perspective, he 3D printed an AR lower and it didn't work. But, you know, he started that ball rolling for some people, and, you know, I guess that's what matters. So I guess it's all perspective, and and I have to try and keep myself humble because I don't want to, like, try and get bitter to the point that it's like, yeah, I know so much about this stuff, and you guys don't know it, and you all suck. Because at the end of the day, I, I identify very – I think I identify stronger, like I said, with the rational side of FOSCAD, which is this is an incredibly cool hobby. It is an amazing learning experience, and I think anyone who's – maybe curious about guns or gun design and curious about CAD and how it works should try and take this stuff on because there's so much stuff you can learn. I've taught myself so much about engineering and design. Like I'm a computer science major, except I'm fairly well versed in mechanical engineering. I'm very well versed in how polymer additive manufacturing works just from all the work I've done. Like I've written technical write-ups and briefs and readmes and tutorials and these sorts of things because that's what really interests me. And I'm not saying that everyone who's interested in printing guns has to be that interested. You can just be interested in building a gun so you can show it off to your friends and say, you know, look what I built. Sure. That, you know, that, that's entirely valid. Because, you know, it's like sort, sort of like the, the Bitcoin thing where you can be, uh, you know, one of these pioneers in cryptocurrency where you create your new wallet or your new, you know, this way to do this or this way to do that. But at the end of the day, it's the people who adopt the technology that make it worth anything. Like, I could sit here and release gun plans all day long, but if no one cared, you know, what's the point? It's the fact that there are people who are willing to say that I'm the next Cody Wilson. While I don't necessarily agree with that or like the way it sounds, it's the fact that there are people who are willing to say that that keeps me motivated to keep going. Because it's like, you know, I, I would do this stuff even if people didn't appreciate it. I would do this stuff even if there were politicians saying that, you know, no, you can't do this. I don't know that I would share it if other people were like, yeah, whatever. Right. Yeah. You you wouldn't take that risk if there wasn't uh, if there wasn't interest, right? right. Um, so you know, I, 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 I yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm certainly with you. Uh, I'm just, I'm just saying, like, and I, I do the same thing myself. Um, you know, for for some things. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, give, give yourself. I mean, yeah, give give yourself some credit. Um, I mean. Uh, you know, as as the question we open up with this interview with, you know, <laughs> which was was kind of was I, I guess kind of I mean it wasn't wasn't planned until like the hour before when he asked that question, but um, it was yeah it was just a you know a, I don't know uh, you're doing you're doing a lot of fantastic work and people recognize it so 
um, yeah, I just want to make sure that that, that, that you acknowledge that, 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 that's all, that's all, that's all. Um, so, uh, I guess, a, a, just a, a few more questions here, man. I mean, it's, it's going to be three hours before we're done with this. Um, so, <laughs> so, so this first one, um, so speaking of rounds, um, raise him, uh, on Twitter. Sorry if I'm, I'm mispronouncing that, sir. Um, do you have any, uh, idea or plans for 3d printing bullets by any chance? I don't know why that's so, necessary now, but is, is, is that possible? Have you thought about it? The, the ultimate problem, and I, 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 one thing that I regret we haven't talked about is project, but what about? And I guess we'll just save that for next time. Sure. So you see, the problem is I can talk, I can talk for so long. And you know, I feel like, you know, because I give the full backstory in every one of these little podcast things that I've done so far, except my backstory keeps getting longer and longer to the point where it's three hours long, and, I, and I'm sitting here like wanting to pull my hair out going like, oh, I forgot this. But so 3D printing bullets and like the home manufacturer of, uh, of car cartridges, right? Home manufacturer of ammunition. It's like one of those things that's like old as time. Like looking back in history, uh, like, like uh, people in Sweden who used to own more than, I forget what the number is, but if you, if you used to own more than like, let's say it's 100 acres of land, the government would require that you pay part of your taxes in urea. So like in in. The, the, the substance that you use to make a substance that's be used in making guns. Yep, yep, like yep, all yep. All the way to way back when, if you owned a lot of land, you had to help make that land to make gunpowder because gunpowder was the most valuable natural resource on Earth for a while because no one really understood how to make it. So the problem, so what I'm getting to is gunpowder is very difficult to make from a standpoint of like acquiring some of the raw materials isn't easy. The particular raw material is potassium nitrate, KNO3, yeah, potassium nitrate. It doesn't, it sort of occurs naturally, like in, in caves, it'll occur naturally just because bat shit has lots of potassium nitrate in it, so you can find it in caves. In fact, during the Civil War, most of the Confederates' uh, gunpowder, they, they, they mined out of the caves that are around uh, Missouri and Illinois, like Merrimack Cavern. Uh, they, they took tons and tons of, you know, potassium nitrate out of for the purpose of making gunpowder. But in places that don't have caves that are full of bats, the problem becomes you've got to make it somehow. And the way you make it is from like fermenting animal piss and shit in a nasty pile. And <laughs> that, that's like the best way to make it. You can also make it like from some hand, if you, if you mix hand warmers with some other common household chemical, you can extract it that way. But you end up needing a lot of freaking hand warmers to make gunpowder. Uh, enough that you'll be on a list, I'm sure. So, so, so what I'm getting at is in places where ammunition is controlled, generally the components to make ammunition is also controlled. Like you can't just go and buy potassium nitrate because in America you can order a quarter ton of potassium nitrate and it'll show up on your doorstep. Mm -hmm. God bless America. But <laughs> other places you can't – in other places that you, you'll, you'll get on a list because potassium nitrate, while it is a good fertilizer, everyone knows you make bombs out of it or gunpowder or you know, God knows what else. You, you make fun stuff out of it. Right. So – because it's controlled in many places that also control ammunition. So 3D printing bullets, I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm not sure then, because you know, here's where gun nomenclature becomes confusing. We could do a whole three-hour podcast on gun nomenclature and why on earth is it so confusing. But if you're talking just about projectiles, like the bullet itself, I don't know why you'd ever 3D print it, because you can lead cast them so incredibly easily. Like, just like it was like a backyard bonfire, light some, stick, you know, some sticks on fire or whatever get a decent fire going, you can melt lead and then cast lead that way. Making bullets will never be hard. You can take wheel weights off of cars and cast lead bullets all day long. In fact, you know, many, many people do this today in America. Lots of people cast their own bullets. Not hard. And if you want to put a jacket on them, there's plastic jackets that you can put on bullets that'll work like a, like a copper jacket to avoid lead fouling in your barrels. So making bullets, I won't even entertain the question of printing them because why would you when you can cast them? Now, if there's questions about like making the whole cartridge, you know, everything together, the hard parts to make are the the gunpowder and the primer. Gunpowder can be made. Some uh, like you can load 45 ACP in black powder and have it run. And black powder isn't near as hard to make as smoke of powder because smoke of powder is dangerous and difficult to make. Mm -hmm. So it's like sort of off the table. And I mean, in gun control com countries, I know of people who make black powder. It's not necessarily hard to do. The problem is the component that takes black powder and makes it smokeless powder is uh, 
it's nitrocellulose. And nitrocellulose is pretty much its only use is in making smokeless powder or other explosives. So it's pretty much always controlled. As well as nitrocellulose mm-hmm. is quite explosive. It just wants to blow up on its own. It's like nitroglycerin where it's like its lot in life is just to explode on its own. <laughs> yeah, it's not as unstable as nitroglycerin, of course, but it, it, wants, to, it wants to burn. Sure. So that's, so that's out of the question then. More or less out of the question, right. Okay. So at least for now. And you know, primers become even more difficult. And again, I, I think there's a guy, I think he's in the he's either in the Philippines or Honduras, and he's making his own twenty two caliber long rifle cartridges. So he's using match head shavings and stuff to make primers for him. Incredible work he's doing. Like, you know, in the, in the theoretical discussions you get into, it would be difficult, but you could do it. But he's actually doing it. Incredible mm. work he's doing. And I won't mention his name because I haven't cleared mentioning his name or his online persona with anyone. But mm-hmm. So it is possible. People are making 22 long rifle cartridges from scratch. But it's difficult. Sure, sure. All right. And, and the second part of this question, which I guess might tie into the um, <clears throat> maybe electri- electromagnetic real gun thing, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure. But um, so the second part of his question was, uh, uh, or uh, have you ever thought about, uh, you know, like 3D guns not using fire, like an uh, air compressor, uh, for example? And hopefully I understand that question because so I don't. Uh, yeah, so, so it's like compressed air guns. So, so like in, in like the, the founding fathers never knew about semi-automatic gun debate. One of the most common ones thrown up is the Giordani air rifle, which was like an air rifle as old as the founding fathers are which was semi-automatic and shot like 50 caliber ammunition of some sort, like a 50 caliber musket ball. But it would do the semi-automatic and at lethal velocities. So air rifle valve design hasn't really evolved since that air rifle. So it's bizarre to think something that old is like the pinnacle design. I'm sure better can be done. But even to this day, there's a couple companies that sell you know, lethal uh, air rifles. There's one that's like a 350 caliber air rifle that's made to like kill like the wild hogs that are all over texas mm-hmm. and you know the idea behind it is it's silent because you know it's, it's just compressed air shooting a bullet at slightly subsonic velocities because whenever it's compressed air you get to choose the velocity by tuning it manually which is super cool but uh, so so i guess to answer this question quickly do i have plans to make a compressed air gun no not really just because admittedly i don't understand compressed air that well it becomes confusing uh, very quickly, but could it be done? It absolutely could be done, and I would love to see it done. There's an old technical document floating around that's by a Brazilian guy, and what he did was make a, like an entire weapon system. It's, it's a full auto, sort of looks like a Thompson. It's a craft-made uh, machine gun that's powered entirely by compressed air. And it's good for, it can do like four mag dumps of 30 rounds before it needs to be, before it loses like vo- uh, terminal velocity on its bullets. But the bullets it shoots are designed to be, so you know, like he includes in his plans like how to make the molds for casting these bullets. So you cast these bullets out of lead, you, the, uh, the casting has like a little stripper clip that they're put on, and then it's just a, a compressed air powered submachine gun. It'll go with your, your bullets hmm. fired by compressed air, and each one is fired at lethal velocity. Crazy little Brazilian dude designed this. It's a blowback, compressed air submachine gun. Incredibly cool and entirely viable. I mean, I would try making it, but again, like he starts going into like tubing sizes and lengths, and uh, you know, I have better things to do, because here in America, that's not a problem for me. I sure. can go and buy 20,000 rounds of ammunition and store them in the basement, and I'll never have to worry about buying ammo for ever. Right. It's huh. been like a long-standing gig of mine where, uh, so ammo in America is, and some people complain it's expensive, but I know that a lot of people have it far worse than I do, so I'll never complain about it. But what I do is I save one bullet for every one that I end up shooting, which means that I end up with my, like a super like doomsday prepper stash of ammo, which is just like, you know, it's good preparation. So for every one bullet I shoot, I store one bullet. Right. And those stored bullets will just sit there and pile up until I don't have room for them, and then I'll try and shoot some of them. But, I'll, you know, I try and keep a running supply of... Uh, the gun room is packed full of ammo. It's got to be, right? If you have if you all these guns, I mean, you got to have something to something to put in them, right? <laughs> you got to. If, if there's ever a buyback for ammo, if, if they're buying, like, assault rifle ammunition 
an assault weapon in air quotes ammunition at one dollar a round. Oh my god, I'm gonna retire before I'm thirty. <laughs> <laughs> so you're under thirty then. <laughs> so you're yeah. wow. So <clears throat> and I, I was gonna uh, I, I was I was thinking about and, and we've got like I mean one I mean basically two questions left. Um, but I was thinking about the introduction I was gonna do for the for this episode and basically it's like. I don't think there's anything Ivan doesn't know about guns. Like, any question that pops up, you know, oh, yeah, here's this, and oh, yeah, here's some historical background, too, and, and all, of the, uh, all of the chemical components and, and all of that uh, uh, that goes into it. Um, is there anything you don't know about guns? This is not one of the final questions. I'm just wondering, is there anything you don't know other than, you know, obviously the air compressor part? But, um, I mean, where are your gaps in knowledge? <laughs> where can people help you out? The chemistry of propellants I'll forever be lacking on. Like, like if I, if you wanted to make a substitute to uh, gunpowder, as well as like smokeless powder, most people hear that and so they think like one gunpowder works in all guns. There's hundreds of different kinds and blends of smokeless powder, different burn rates and different pressure curves. And I wish I understood that better. I only understand that well enough that I can load my own ammunition on a reloading press, which is really like a you set your die to or you, you set your reloader so it releases this much powder and then you measure that much powder and make sure it's how much powder it threw out and then you just reload. You go from there, just chug, 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 chug your way through all of your empty cases. Hmm. That, that, you know, that doesn't really mean I understand it. That means I know how to work with it. So that's like the difference between a machine operator and a machinist. A machinist knows how to do it. A machine, machinist knows what's going on. The machinist knows how to do it. Right, right. So I, I know how to reload. I don't really know what's going on there. So my knowledge of ballistics, a little lacking as well. Like, I understand the bullet spin rate, and I understand, like, I know the stabilization equation. I can't really, like, come up with stuff on my own, though. Like, if you wanted me to design a bullet, I'd say uh, make it, like, 9mm, because 9mm is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and I, 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 I ask that question because there are people listening, uh, obviously, who... Um, you know, might know some things about something that you don't know. And uh, obviously this is, uh, it's, it's all open source. It's, uh, uh, you know, this, yeah, this is all open source. We're, we're trying to come up with solutions to, to all of these things. So uh, if someone's out there that, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure Ivan's down to learn more. Are you down to learn more? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm down for, you know, <laughs> anytime someone wants to get skin in the game, like, you know, the, the people will tell you, oh, it's so dangerous and you'll go to jail forever. But you know, at least if you're in America, I don't want to speak for if you're in different countries because I can't speak about that because I have no experience about that. But if you're in America, as it, so long as you're not breaking laws, exercise your rights because you only have the rights that you're willing to exercise. And like that's hand in hand with the quote, like you only have the rights you're willing to die for. So I'm not saying that you have to die for these rights in particular. Don't die for any right that you don't feel like dying for. But if you have these rights, why not try exercising? If, if you're interested in this sort of stuff, if you've got a background in combustion of certain chemicals, which would lead me to already believe that you're already you know, involved in gunpowder synthesis. But you know, if you've got a background that's related to gunpowder synthesis but isn't exactly gunpowder syn synthesis, but you're interested in like chipping in, getting some skin in the game, write some tech documents for people. Like, to Try and see if you can find a replacement for nitrocellulose that isn't so dangerous, you know, difficult to make. I know, I know a couple people who are interested in doing that and I don't want to drop their names or talk about what they're doing because I'm not cleared to do so with them but you know that that sort of thing is being investigated but the more people we have on it you know the closer we'll come to finding a you know permanent solution because I'm sure one exists it's just a matter of got to get a bunch of chemists in the same room Exactly, exactly. And, uh, you know, just as, uh, you know, here in the Vani podcast, Vani was just, it's an open source investi investigation into, you know, how to become, in how, how to uh, be as invulnerable to the coercion of the state and uh, the servile society uh, as, as humanly possible. And uh, whether it's, uh, whether it's guns, whether it's uh, Bitcoin, no matter what it is, um, a lot, th th these things are open source. Um, and, uh, you know, the they only work if, if people get involved and, and uh, uh, you know, build and learn and, and uh, coordinate with each other. So um, that was the reason for that question. Um, and uh, obviously, deterrence dispensed exists. And I'm sure um, that, uh, you know, if, if, if this is something that, you, that, that you're interested in and want to get, in, get involved in or if you're already involved in it and want to connect with, uh, with Ivan and, and those folks, I'm sure, I'm sure there's, a way, uh, there's, there's a way to do that. Um, but yeah, that that was a, the the point of that question is uh, you know we're, we're we're trying to figure all this shit out and uh, we're 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 trying we're we're trying to be free right uh, so uh, that's uh, that's what it comes down to um, so 
and this is kind of th- this uh, this last th- this last listener question before my final question, uh, which I'm super excited about. Um, is uh, what do you? It, it's more of kind of a, a future outlook. Uh, what, what do you think the worldwide political reaction will be once easily printed uh, homemade guns reach a commercial level quality? What do you think? So that's like two questions in one, and I'm going to take the second question first, and that's like, do you? I'm going to make this question. Do you think? Wh- where do you think the quality of printed guns are? So I had shown and proven with my homemade barrel that you can shoot groups as accurate or more accurate than some factory produced guns, which is like, right, that's an indication, right? So you can make yourself a gun that's just as accurate, if not more accurate than a factory handgun. So it's, it's not as accurate as some like accurized, very expensive target pistols, but it's more accurate than like, say, pick a, you know, a cheap manufacturer's uh, particular handgun. So, you know, we're on a track to make a gun that's at least as accurate. Reliability and longevity we've got. Reliability we don't really have. So we just need to put, you know, we need to put those three things together. Reliability, accuracy, and longevity. Once we have those three things together and we've got a project to do it, I think, I think everyone's going to be amazed that I, I don't think, I think even people who, even I, I'm close to this project. I don't even think I'm prepared for, you know, the state of the tech to be in a place where, with very, very minimal work. You know, most of the work is done by the printer. A little bit of work of, with metal working has to be done by you, of course, because you can't print metal easily yet, and some parts have to be metal. But with this unholy matrimony of uh, metal, you know, simple metal working with uh, printed plastic parts, you're going to be able to have a semi-automatic 9mm pistol caliber carbine that's going to be made entirely not a single part on that gun is going to be a gun, in air quotes, part, based on what the EU says is a gun part. Because the EU says lots of things are gun parts that the United States doesn't. <laughs> the United States says just the receiver is. The EU says all sorts of things are gun parts. We're going to make a gun just like, you know, Moody, the guy from the UK who made the submachine gun with hardware, star, hardware store parts only. That's essentially the approach we're taking, only we're adding a 3D printer to make it so there's not much work that you yourself have to do. So, again, it could be something where... You really don't have to know much about metalworking. You just have to be able to follow instructions. And that's the goal we're going for. So, did, so fact, the, the factory level of quality question. Uh, I think, you know, depending on what your idea of factory level quality, if your idea of factory level quality is like Daniel Defense or one of these people who are like ultra uber precision AR uppers and lowers and all this crap, I don't know that, you know, the home workshop will never be able to attain that. But if your idea of factory quality is like better than Taurus, we can do better than Taurus. I guarantee we can do better than Taurus. <laughs> I like that, man. So in your, own, in your own home workshop, you can do better than Taurus. So then the first part of that question now, what's the political backlash to that going to be like? I'm sure it's going to be endless. Like we have to ban, you know, it, it's, it's ban culture. So we're going to... I mean, the worst case scenario, you know, there's a push to ban making your own firearm in the United States. As if such a ban would be, it's like, uh, prohibitionary bans are stupid, right? Mm-hmm. And the entire, we need to elaborate on that. They're stupid and they don't work. This, this is evidence throughout history. Yeah, you, you don't. Statistically and historically. Definitely don't explain that to folks on this podcast. <laughs> definitely don't. <No. laughs> so, if you institute a prohibit pro, prohibition prohibitionatory, that's probably a made-up word, if you introduce that sort of a ban as a reaction to someone showing that you can make a gun in your home so easily that anyone will be able to do it, it's like like waving the white flag of, help, I'm a complete idiot as far as politics go, because we're here telling you anyone's able to make this gun, doesn't matter what what you say, now you're going to pass a law that says, no, you can't do it. It's so easy; it doesn't matter what you say, because you know, because because you know, our, our goal here is, you know, Co- Co- Cody was all about the we're going to make them shut down your internet, right? We're going to make them you know, destroy yeah. the, tear the internet sorry, sorry, Calif- the sorry California, sorry California, your laws are going to be so draconian from what we're doing uh, <laughs> that you know we're sorry, but uh, yeah, we're sorry. <laughs> that. You know, what, what we're what we're going to shoot for is we're going to make them ban car batteries. We're going to make them ban 12 volt power supplies. We're going to make them ban salt water because you can use these things to manufacture a barrel for a gun. 
We're going to make them ban hydraulic tubing. We're going to make them ban 3D printer filament. We're going to make them ban 3D printers. That's what it's going to take them to make this impossible. It's going to make them tear apart the world as we know it. Are they going to license 3D printer owners? Absurd. They don't have that much money. I'm calling the government's bluff right now. You do not have that much money. You do not have that many resources to actually do that. You can talk about it. You can say anybody who has a 3D printer is in violation of the law. You can force people to comply just by scaring them like that. But you won't stop what we've started. And it's too late to stop us now. You know, the, the, the ball is already in motion. I've already got 95%, not 95%, it's probably about 50% of this tech write-up about how to make your own barrels that's like written it like and explained like I'm five level. So like anyone who's capable of reading and understanding, so anyone who I trust to wield a firearm will be able to make their own barrel. So if, if you're at the level of, if you're at the level of you can wield a firearm safely, I assume you're also capable of reading. And so I assume you're also capable of now making your own barrel. Right. No, oh, man, that's, that's, that's so fantastic to hear. And I've, there's something I want to, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so yeah, let's, let's talk in, in, in post-production about it, or I guess in post-show or some other time about uh, an interesting idea in regards to that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just, I just had a really, really fucking fantastic idea. Um, but uh, anyway, let, let's, and, and what she just said there is going to, like, I was, I was going to like, I guess we'll see what the answer to your question to this next, to this final question is, but what she just said there might be the introductory clip to, to this episode. We'll see. But, uh, so <clears throat> this, this, this final question here. So if, if hell froze over, and uh, Senator Melendez, or whatever the, the hell his name was, uh, if he was listening to this podcast, is there anything you would like him to hear? I mean, I'm not, I'm not like an un- inconsiderate person. Like, I'd like to sit down with him, and I would like to educate him on specifically what those files for the AR-15 were for. If he wants to throw a fit about the Glock files, I understand that, right? I understand what he's coming from. I, I just like, like, like these laws that are being passed that that in order for any lawmaker to propose gun legislation, they have to pass like a basic gun IQ test. I wish that would be instituted for every single politician, for every single topic that, that can possibly be legislated on. That if an uh, uh, elected official can't demonstrate a working knowledge of the thing that they're legislating on, they have no business legislating on it. I don't know if you've heard Todd Aiken when he, when he was talking about rape, and his, his exact quote was, in the case of a legitimate rape, a woman's body has a way to shut that whole thing down. And as a result, she doesn't need an abortion because her body can just like abort the baby on its own if it's a legitimate rape. I, I don't mm. know where the hell you get this stuff, make it up, from Todd Aiken, but there's a reason Todd Aiken didn't get reelected because that's the stupidest thing I've actually ever heard. And I use that as a reference, like whenever anti-gun politicians like say stuff like, you know, the AR-15 shoots heat-seeking bullets that would basically cook the meat, it's so powerful. <laughs> Have they ever so said that before? Yeah, there, there's a lady from California. Oh my, the, the, oh the my AR-15 God, basically dude. shoots seeking bullets, go after the heat, and it, it's so powerful that it basically cooks the meat and burns the meat when it shoots them. Jesus like, fucking Duh. Christ. <laughs> and, and these are the kinds of people who make the laws that we're forced to abide by. So I wish all politicians, Todd Aiken, when he's coming to talk about rape has to pass, like a basic IQ test on, do you know where babies come from? Is... Is contraception, is the, I don't know, is conception something that you understand at all? In the same way, whenever these types from California, Diane Feinstein and the, and, and Menendez, whenever they're, they're proposing like these 3D gun bans, do you know what a 3D printer is? Do you know what a CAD file is? Do you know what it means to make a gun? Do you know what laws are currently in place in this country in which you reside? Like, like, and if you can't demonstrate you know what you're talking about, you have no business making laws about it. Right, yeah, no, I, I'm right there with you, and it was, um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, going back to Cody again, sorry, guys, um, but yeah, going, going back to Cody again, um, when I, when I interviewed him, um, basically, I guess, um, <clears throat> the, the reaction, um, from what he was doing wasn't necessarily about the, it, it was, it was kind of just the fact that all of these Democratic politicians had realized that it's been legal in America to manufacture your own gun without a serial number since forever. Like they just like that's what he said. They just realized this, and they're pissed. <laughs> they just realized this, and that's why there's so much backlash. Um, do you think that's 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 
True. Correct. Right. Right. And, and you know, because and, and I feel like right because who are senators? They're old people, right? They're fuds. They're boomers at this point. They don't understand 3D printing. Just the same way that the pro-gun boomers don't understand 3D printing. Hey, but what about the bear? Are you printing the bear out of plastic? The same way. You know, so they understand guns. They understand you're not printing the bear out of plastic. On the other hand of things, like the equally asinine is the people who are anti-gun who are fuds and boomers. They're like, oh my God, they're printing the entire gun out of the printer and they're going to bring it on the airplane and they're going to shoot them up like 9-11. It's not going to happen. You can't print an entire plastic gun. It's never been proven to exist. And until you prove something to exist, it doesn't exist. Like your, your hypothetical posturing isn't what we should be making laws about. Oh, but somebody could is not a reason that we should make law in this country. Right. Yep, it's the, uh, it's the abuse of the precautionary principle, uh, precautionary principle. It's that something could go wrong, therefore it should be illegal. Um, it's, 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 yeah, the, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, ban everything culture. Uh, it is. Uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, certainly, certainly. Uh, that's, 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 that's where we, that's society, society we live in. But uh, thankfully there are folks like you, uh, uh, you know, working uh, extremely hard uh, in your spare time, not for, not for a paycheck or anything. You're just, uh, you, you know, uh, devoted to the cause of freedom and devoted to, uh, you know, just uh, something you enjoy doing. Um, and uh, those things, uh, it's always fantastic when those things overlap. Something you're passionate about, um, uh, you know, also coincides with the cause of freedom. So, um, you know, I, I, Ivan, I, I'm so appreciative of the work that you're doing. Uh, and I know, God, there's so many people on Twitter that are too, uh, clearly. Um, <clears throat> so many people. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm so appreciative that you came onto the podcast. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next one too. Um, because I, I, I've talked to people that know a lot about guns. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people that know a lot about guns, but um, I don't know, man. I mean, you're 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 down in the trenches, and uh, you're 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 building the stuff from from the ground up uh, as far as uh, uh, 3D printing. And all, uh, again, maybe not from the ground up. There's people that you know laid steps for you, but um, a lot of times you're you're doing the stuff stuff from the ground up. So I'm super appreciative of what you're doing, man, and uh, and and keep doing it. Um, keep doing it. Um, you know, d d despite the fear, obviously, if, the, if there's if there's any threat to, to, to yourself or your family or anything like that, that, that that's one thing. But, um, you know, th there hasn't been anything yet. Right. Uh, you know, New Jersey hasn't uh, you know prosecuted anybody. I don't know. It's, it's important work. That's the point. I agree completely. Right on. Right on. So I guess um, for, for, for the final question here, um, I guess, um, is there um, any closing thoughts you'd like to leave with the, leave for the listeners, or uh, anything you'd like to plug uh, before before I let you go? Uh, I mean, um, well, I'll, I'll start with the first one. Any closing thoughts for the listeners? Oh boy, um, closing thoughts. You'll have to stay tuned. I think this platform would be really good for doing some like introductory sort of things, because I mean, I, I don't want to like sound like I'm accusing you or anything or making fun of you, but it seems like you're uh, where, where like a lot of the people who are interested in what I'm doing in the same case that you're in where you're very interested in what I'm doing, you support what I'm doing, but you don't really understand it like at a, at a detailed level, perhaps Correct. as a, as a detailed level as you'd like to. And I feel like, you know, this platform would be a great one for, we need, we, sh we need to do a printing gun 101. I've wanted to for a long time. And I feel like this would be like the perfect, and we could even make a series out of it if you wanted, but I feel like that would be a great way for me to, because, you know, doing these sort of things also helps me keep on track and, helps keep me humble and keep helps keep me in line and you know, helps me see you know the direction things are going of course so it's, it's not like it's without benefit to me and you know, like like I've like I've sort of alluded to and I think I've even come out and said already you know the more people I can get involved in this the better because I just want people to exercise their rights and you know if people are interested in this sort of things I want them to get involved in it because I mean it's fun it really is and you know, people might not people might not appreciate it but it is. It's fun. You know, maybe not everyone gets a kick out of it. I see that. And, you know, may, maybe buying guns. And I don't want to sound condescending. There's nothing wrong with buying guns from a gun store and, you know, supporting the Second Amendment that way. But I personally don't, you know, I don't get a kick out of going and filling out a background check and uh, doing it that way. I get a kick out of you know, what's the hardest possible way that I can go to acquire this gun. So yep. I make as much of it as, myself, as I can myself which is probably silly, and it's not like I couldn't pass a background check. It's, it's not like I don't want to do a background check. It's just that anyway, the DIY pride in anything I do 
sort of like a, a driving force behind it. But yeah, uh, as far as ma main closing thought, we, we should definitely do a printing gun 101. I'm I'm totally down for that, man. I've I've enjoyed this conversation so much. You you have a wealth of knowledge, and I really I'm wish, talking. I really wish that I understood more of it. And uh, you know, through further discussions and uh, through following your work, I know I will. Uh, and that's uh, that I'm I'm, I'm really really looking forward to that. So um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And I guess uh, to 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 before I let you go, uh, is there anything you like to plug? Um, I mean, you, you said you had uh, had Bitbacker. Um, there's, uh, there's, uh, the, uh, um, the Eternus distributed, uh, Twitter page. Um, how can people get in contact with you? How can people get involved, um, if they're interested in what you're doing? So for like very specific questions, or if you want to like pitch ideas at me, you can email me directly at ivanthetroll at protonmail.com. For those of you that don't know, if you, if you make your own protonmail.com account, which is free, uh, any other protonmail account you send to automatically has PGP encryption, which is cool. Set it up for you, takes care of the, you don't have to plug in any keys yourself. Oh, it is so nice. Uh, I mean, I messed around with PGP just enough to learn that just use Proton Mail since it's free and they're very privacy minded and uh, pro free speech and that sort of thing. So they're, they're great. Um, you can find me there uh, on Twitter at the Turns Dispensed. I'm on Gunstreamer at Ivan the Troll. Uh, Bitbacker, if you want to send us money uh, so we can buy tacos and Kool-Aid and that sort of, I mean, bullets and printer filament, of course. But, I mean, maybe you could, I mean, I guess you're indirectly funding my taco and Kool-Aid addictions. I eat tacos and Kool-Aids when I make guns. But <laughs> if you want to indirectly fund that, if you want to, sub, if you want to subsidize my Kool-Aid addiction, you can do so by giving me the cryptocurrency at Bitbacker, where at deterrence dispensed there i guess the easiest way to you know i'm sure there's going to be the people like you know where, where can you find the fun stuff right the we've we've started a technical data pack library like we've got the m14 we got the m16 we've got 1928 thompson we have so much cool stuff that i drool over like the, the most cool thing i think we've got is an original in german set of prints for the stg 44 like written like they're they're letter headed from berlin so, like, from, from 1944, in fact, so ridiculously cool World War II Nazi German prints for the STG-44 we've got in our technical data package library. You can find that at my Keybase website, and the easiest way to find that is, like, the my website. If you go to my Twitter profile, at Deterrence Dispensed, you can find it as, like, my linked website. It's pretty... Pretty interesting stuff. Like the stuff we've done so far that I mentioned in this podcast, plus our technical data package library, which is just ever growing. But that's pretty much all the things that I have to plug. Very good, very good. I don't have anything else to say. Like that, that was fantastic. And uh, you know, again, I'm I'm super appreciative of the work that you're doing. Um, you know, uh, no matter what uh, what field it is in the pursuance of freedom, I, I love talking to people that. Um, that uh, that are doing things. Um, so I, I've gotten so sick of over the past. I mean, that's why I started this podcast. It's why I started uh, Elio Radio back. Uh, well, it's not why I started Elio Radio, but it's why um, you know when I became an anarchist. Um, I knew people were just talk people were just posting memes of like taxation is theft and, and all that shit. And I was like, why don't we find freedom now? Like that sounds like a good idea. Why don't we do that? And it's like, no, we should talk about the philosophy. We should you know you know do all this stuff more. And it's like, no, let's do things. Um, so I, I'm always appreciate people that are that are doing things um, and doing things in the, especially doing things in the cause of freedom. So, um, you know, um, you know, thank you so much for your service, man. Um, it was an honor to chat with you, and uh, I'm super. I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing it again. Absolutely, me too. Right on, right on. So, uh, and there you have it. Uh, so please do go check out uh, the incredible work uh, Ivan and uh, you know this decentralized team uh, are doing, and uh, support them however you can. Uh, definitely go to Bitbacker, uh, you know, shoot them a, a super chat, and uh, tell them what you want them to do. Uh, you know, just you know, give them an idea, um, let them know what, what, what you want, and uh, um, I'm sure they'll do their best to uh, to do that. Um, as long as it's not something like uh, you know electromagnetic like real gun or um, actually a question I didn't get to, man. This was a funny one. Damn it! Uh, something about like attaching like mini guns. attaching like <laughs> drones with mini guns and shit. Like obviously that was a troll question, but um, you know if that's what you want them to, do, if, if you're like, hey, you should you know 3D print a 3D print a drone and attach a mini gun to it, a 3D printed mini gun. Um, you know, shoot them some money and tell them that's what you that, what you want them to do. It probably won't happen, but I mean, your voice will be heard, yeah, right, if, Ivan? 
If the FAA weren't dicks, I absolutely would try it. But the FAA don't like you putting guns on autonomous airplanes for whatever <laughs> reason. I, I, don't, I don't know what the problem is. Why don't you kill Joyce? Right. Even though they, they do themselves. But, um, yeah, you know, drone, right. you know, drone bombing, you know, many weddings and shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't do that. Well, hell, you can't, like, even without a, even without a gun on it. I mean, aren't, uh, you know, drones pretty regulated anyway? Yeah, it has to be, like, within your line of sight the whole time or whatever. Yeah, fuck, fuck, party crashers. Can't do anything fun. Well, you can, you just don't tell them about it. Don't let them find out. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, so, so, yeah, that's all I got, guys. Um, now, I guess, the thing I'll close out with is that, now, I, typ- I don't typically self-aggrandize, um, but, guys, these last couple interviews... Um, with Ivan, with Smuggler, they've been bangers. Like honestly, like I, 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 I'm surprised they even happened to begin with. And I'm, not, I'm not surprised about the quality of them, but I mean, it's just, it's just better than I ever expected. So if you aren't already subscribed to the podcast feed, you need to just search for the Bonnie Podcast on your favorite podcatcher, and please do consider leaving us a positive review. It doesn't really help us much in iTunes, but it helps my ego um, to know that people are listening, I guess. But um, yeah, and future interviews with Ivan too. Is it possible to create pockets of freedom where personal autonomy is respected? In the novella, Hashtag Agora, Daniel LaRusso finds out the answer firsthand. After discovering Bitcoin, he becomes immersed in the cypherpunk underground. Encryption, ghost pads, temporary autonomous zones, and much more. He learns the benefits of freedom, of these tools for self-liberation, and how truly free individuals could conduct their affairs outside of the servile society. Based on real individuals in modern-day Berlin, Germany, Hashtag Agora gives you a practical representation of how freedom pioneers can carve out pockets of freedom in an otherwise enslaved world. Get your paperback copy today by visiting tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. And for more titles like this, please search for Liberty Under Attack publications on Amazon.